These reforms grew in Minneapolis police custody last year. United Airlines is being hit with a fine for long tarmac delays. The Department of Transportation fined United nearly $2 million for 25 delays that affected more than 3,200 passengers. Airlines must allow passengers the opportunity to return to the terminal after more than three hours on the tarmac for domestic flights and four hours for international. Michael Kastner, NBC News Radio. Joan Esposito Live Local and Progressive on WCPT Willow Springs is powered by ComEd. Lower your energy bills and reduce your carbon footprint with the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program. Do you have Medicare and do you use a CPAP machine? This is a national health care alert regarding your CPAP supplies. Using a clean CPAP mask and clean supplies is important to staying healthy. The best way to make sure your CPAP equipment is clean is to get new supplies. If you have Medicare, we have great news. Medicare will pay for you to have new clean supplies every 90 days. We'll even do all the paperwork for you to make sure that there's little to no out-of-pocket cost to you and you don't even have to leave your home we provide free in-home delivery so if you're a cpap user and you have medicare staying healthy with new cpap equipment is easy just make this free phone call right now to get started call the cpap hotline now 800-218-9520 800-218-9520 that's 800-218-9520 co-pays and deductible supply supplies are replaced in accordance with medicare guidelines This is Gary Menzel from Roofers and Waterproofers Local 11. Are you happy with your job or are you looking for a new and exciting career? Wouldn't you like to get up early every morning and head into work so that you could be home early to take your kids to baseball, basketball, or gymnastics practice? Consider a career with us. We're professionally skilled roofers and waterproofers, OSHA trained for on-the-job safety, and our union is growing. Construction remains strong in Illinois and Wisconsin where we just recently opened a brand new apprenticeship training center near Madison. Union roofers and waterproofers work outside in the fresh air every day, and we get paid well for the hard work we do. We have family health care and a pension plan that you'll be glad you have when you're planning your retirement someday. We want you to earn a living wage and learn to work safely. So if you're ready to join roofers and waterproofers Local 11, give us a call, 708-345-0970 and learn more about us at RoofersLocal11.org. Welcome to The Big Picture, a show that takes a deep dive into the political landscape of not only the world, but right here in our own backyard of Illinois. It's showtime, folks. The Big Picture is on WCPD 820. And now, here's your host, Edwin Eisentrath. Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday. As you just heard from that intro, today I'm starting a show called The Big Picture. Not sure we'll get to the whole world, at least not today, but here we are. And right off, I want to thank the folks at WCPT, tell them how grateful I am for this opportunity. Um, Paul, I'm sitting in here with you. You work in the board. It's been great. I'm happy to be here. You know, I love talking to interesting people, and and I've spent you know, the better part of 35 years in and around progressive politics and causes. I've been an educator and an alderman. I've worked in local campaigns and presidential ones. I've worked in the federal government. I've led a public housing authority. And for many years, I worked in the private sector. That work took me to all kinds of corners of the world, most often to the Middle East, where I learned so much about the things that tie us all together. So now I'm stepping into this time slot, and I'm mindful that Dick Kay and his show Back to the Beat came before me. Back on the Beat came before me, excuse me. Dick was the first person who interviewed me when I uh, first uh, was elected to city council. He was also the last to interview me when I ran for governor many years later. He was a journalist giant and one of a kind. No one can replace him. So this will be a new adventure you and I can go on together. And happily, we've had some practice. I've been filling in here for, oh, I don't know, about 10 weeks, which has given me a bit of time to get to know you, and I hope for you to get to know me. Uh, I hope the conversations that we have had and the ones we'll continue to have uh, and the guests I book um, will be interesting and fun and help make sense of the torrent of news that's coming at us. Uh, Look, my goal for our time together is pretty simple. 
I want to talk uh, about politics, about policies, about the nuts and bolts of organizing and winning. But I also want to talk about the kind of country and society all this politics aims to support. And in the end, I hope we all come away having connected the dots and are able to see the big picture. I am uh, particularly fortunate to be able to start with the perfect guest. Um, and so my, my first guest is uh, Saru Jaraiman, and Saru leads the One Fair Wage campaign. She is remarkable. She spent, I don't know, 20 years organizing and advocating for raising wages and improving working conditions for restaurant and other service workers. She is um, probably not going to tell you this, so I will. She's a graduate of Yale Law School and the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, CNN listed her as the as in the top ten visionary women, and she was recognized as a champion for change in the Obama White House. She she's going to tell us a little bit about one fair wage, what led her to it, and why it's so important. <clears throat> Forgive my coughing, Saru. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, did I get it right? This intro. <laughs> yes, mostly. Yes. So, so here's what people don't understand. You're so smart and talented and accomplished that you can do anything you want to do. So people ask uh, of women who are that talented, I, why would you do this? But I, personally, I can't imagine wanting to do anything else when you can be an effective champion for justice. That's my response, too. I mean, as long as you've got the level of insane economic inequality in this country and racial and gender inequality. I don't know how you can do anything else really except fight it. Put all of your skills and talents towards fighting it. So um, talk a little bit about the particular campaign. Particular, I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of that going around and you focused on, on a very big corner of it. Talk about that, the part that you're focused on. Tell people what the reality is that you see every day. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I've been organizing restaurant workers for 20 years, and what we've learned over the last 20 years is that this is, the restaurant industry, the second largest and absolute number one fastest growing private sector employer in the United States. Of course, it took a huge hit during the pandemic, but it remains one in 10 American workers that work in restaurants. That's the number of jobs. The problem is that these have been the absolute lowest paying jobs for generations. Actually, it goes all the way back to slavery, which is when this issue, what I've been fighting, the wage structure in this industry originated. At emancipation, the restaurant lobby, now called the National Restaurant Association, wanted the ability to hire black people for free and basically found a way to do that. They mutated the notion of tipping from being an extra or bonus on top of the wage to becoming the wage itself, which it never was. Tipping originated in feudal Europe. It was always an extra bonus on top of the wage. It became the wage itself at emancipation so that restaurants wouldn't have to pay black people any wages. And that became the law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when everybody got the right to the minimum wage except for millions of black workers, including tipped restaurant workers, who were told you get a $0 wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. So we went from zero in 1938 with the New Deal all the way up to the absurd and ridiculous $2.13 an hour. The current federal minimum wage for tipped workers today, 43 states, follow this ridiculous legacy of slavery, the sub-minimum wage, including Illinois, including blue and red states. Most states pay this sub-minimum wage for an overwhelmingly majority female workforce who's been struggling with the highest rates of poverty and sexual harassment for generations, and it just got so much worse with the pandemic. So, Saru, um, the, the industry argues that with tips, the wage is... Um, better than minimum wage for most people. Have you found that to be true or not true? The median wage with tips across the country is still under $10 an hour, which, first of all, that is not anything anybody can live on pretty much anywhere. 
But uh, putting that aside, putting that aside, I think what workers overwhelmingly discovered during the pandemic and so many new prior to the pandemic is that that is that is actually not a sustainable way to live. The actual wage you're getting from the employer is two, three, four dollars an hour, depending on your state. To have to live on the vagaries of tips, even if on median year round they may bring you to nine bucks an hour, to have to live on the vagaries of tips that are, you know, high sometimes Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, very low for Wednesday morning breakfast. If you're a parent and you want to be home with your children on Friday or Saturday night, you are screwed. You are going to make very little in money. And then for it to change with the pandemic, with hurricanes, with blizzards, I mean, climate change is really impacting these workers' ability to have a stable income, which they never had. It is not a way to live. And when you put on top of that just the ethics of the situation, what do we as Americans call it when an employer gets away with paying nearly nothing and, and profiting off the value of workers' labor and saying, we don't have to pay these workers' wages. The customers should pay they them do it for too. us. Yeah. So, so know, Saru, I, in, in pre- preparing to talk to you, I, you know, I, I actually was out last night for dinner, and I asked uh, the person who waited on our table um, about the quality of working in the industry mm-hmm. Um and his, his number one concern was exactly what you just raised, which is the, um, the vagaries of, of when the money comes in. He said, I, I, look, there are months when I can't pay my rent because, you know what, it, it snowed that month and I had a lot of, I wanted to have the heat on, um, but people weren't coming out to eat. So I, had, I didn't get paid. He said, he said That's right. it was a terrible situation for him. And he said, you know what, he only does this part-time now. He has a steady job somewhere else. That's right. And, and everything you described is like the epitome of what's happening in our industry. First of all, it was a totally unreliable way to live. Prior to the pandemic, you had not just the, the kind of fluctuations that occur for all workers, but for women in particular, having to tolerate all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior. I want to talk about that, too. Harassment. Yeah, yeah, to get yeah. the tip. But also for black people, the data has shown for years that regardless of the quality of their service, they are always tipped less than white workers. People of color always tip less. I mean, when you are relying on the biases, whims, and just emotions, uh, you know, how they respond to you of customers, it is, it is completely unreliable. And that got so much worse with the pandemic. Listen, with the pandemic, we're asking these workers, go and force social distancing masks and now even vaccination card rules on the very same customers from whom you have to get tips to make up your base wage. It is an impossible situation. In fact, it's led, as you've seen in the news, to violence where workers are trying to enforce these rules, right. getting punched and shot and, and hit. And, and they're, they're saying in the millions, we're done. We are walking away from this industry because you never paid us enough, and now it's unlivable. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard stories um, f- of female wait staff who were told in the pandemic, take off your mask so I can see if you're cute enough to tip. That's right. We conducted a massive survey last fall when workers had gone back to work, you know, during the summertime, during the first year of the pandemic, and worker, 50% of workers, 50% of women said sexual harassment went way up during the pandemic. Mind you, this was the industry that already had the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the U.S. I mean, there's a professor named Catherine McKinnon who really is responsible for coining the term sexual harassment and making it illegal in the U.S., she has said, I, I, this industry, the tipped service industry, dwarfs all other sector, sectors in terms of sexual harassment, including, she said, the military. Mm. So we already have the highest levels. Here are women, 50% of women saying it went way up, and hundreds of women we documented reporting male customers saying to them, take off your mask so I can see how cute you are before I decide how much to tip you, which changed this issue from being a matter of race and gender and economic injustice to becoming truly a matter of life and death, which is why so many workers are leaving. So you you describe an industry that is um, low wage, high harassment, and also one where there is uh, a good deal of discrimination. As you say, uh, uh, black staff get paid less than 
white staff because that's how people tip, that's right. right? So that's, that's, a, right. that's three strikes, I think. I mean, I don't know, what yeah. does it say about our country that one of the fastest growing industries we have is one that has those three features? That's right. And I mean, it, honestly, what it says is that we've had, frankly, too long a history of elected officials, 150 years of elected officials rolling over to the whims of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association that's really driven by the chains, IHOPs, Applebee's, Olive Garden's parent company, Darden. There's about a hundred of them and they drive this trade lobby, which in, in turn it has so much power, not just over fed, national, you know, national politics, federal politics, but in every state, the Restaurant Association wields just undue influence over elected officials who take money from the Restaurant Association and, are, and feel bullied by the Restaurant Association and don't listen to the actual desires of the people. I got to tell you, Edwin, when we have polled every state in the U.S. and nationally, do you think people should get a livable wage? And do you think tipped workers should get a full minimum wage with tips on top? Most people respond saying, wait a second, I thought they already were getting a full minimum wage and that my tips were on top. Of course, of course they should get a full livable wage. Nobody in America agrees with this except the Restaurant Association. And somehow we've got elected officials from both parties allowing that to happen and keeping the wage at the disgraceful $2.13 an hour. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see any justice in that. But let me, let me try and put myself in a different place to ask this question. Chicago, it's where I am, is a very big restaurant yeah. city. And no doubt better working conditions and better pay will mean an enormous amount to thousands of people. But the restaurant owners and others in the business community will say, oh, well, that just means there'll be fewer jobs. The restaurants will close and the cost of going out will go up for absolutely everyone. What's the best way to answer those concerns? So first of all, there are seven states that has actually ended the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Montana, Alaska, and a neighboring state to you, Minnesota. They have required the same full minimum wage with tips on top for generations, and they have actually higher restaurant industry sales, higher job growth per capita in the restaurant industry, higher small business restaurant growth, higher rates of tipping, because when you pay people better, they tip better, and one half the rate of sexual harassment as the industry in Illinois. Wait, half so the it's, rate? It's one half the rate. Because it turns out when you pay people a full livable wage, they don't actually have to put up with as much from customers. They get tips. In fact, they get more tips in those states than they get in Illinois. But they're not completely dependent on the tips. They, get, they can count on a wage from their boss, like every other worker in every other industry. So when a customer tries to grab them or say something to them, they can, they can swap that away. They can say, no, I'm not going to put up with so that. So they get their dignity back. That's right. And, so, and, and the other thing i got to say is that you're, the, the things you've been saying is what the Restaurant Association has been saying for so long, yeah. literally 100 years. There's no way we can pay these workers. The jobs will be lost. You know, we're going to die. i got to tell you, just this past week we released a report we documented in a two-week period 1,621 restaurants in 41 states, including Illinois, that are now paying an average of 1350 plus tips. These are restaurants who said it could never be done. Why? Because they can't get workers to come back to work any other way. And they are proving everything that they said just a few months ago is a lie because they're offering it right now. They have no choice but to offer it to get these workers to come back. Listen, I totally get that restaurant owners struggled during the pandemic, but so did workers. Yeah. And if we're going to come back, we got to come back better together where employers can do well and absolutely so can workers too. S Saru, um, will you stay with me as I take a quick commercial break? Sure. Thank you so much. We will be right back with this really interesting conversation. I'm David Hochberg. It's Saturday. You're a veteran who served our country and can use a VA loan to either purchase a new home or refinance your existing home, but you don't know who you can trust. Team Hochberg respects your service and has VA loan experts available right now to answer your questions and help you secure a VA loan. 
Team Hochberg has helped thousands of radio listeners secure VA loans, but we can help if you don't call 855-563-2843 or visit 56david.com. Homesite Financial Legal Housing Lender, LMS 112461. We've all been spending more time indoors than usual, but FinishingChicago.com has an offer to update your interior. Whether your space is residential or commercial, for a limited time, you can save up to 25% on painting and decorating. FinishingChicago.com has the most dynamic interior spaces available from industry-leading union craftspeople. That's union quality, efficiency, and industry-leading expertise in your home or commercial space. Visit FinishingChicago.com to find a contractor in your area. This unprecedented access to union quality labor at a reduced rate is only available for a limited time. Revitalize your spaces with fine decorative upgrades applied by the most knowledgeable craftspeople in the industry. Whether it's a new color or transforming your walls into something truly special, our contractors have all the options. Take advantage of FinishingChicago.com's update your interior savings before they're gone. For up to 25% off your new finish, start with FinishingChicago.com. To the big picture with Edwin Eisendraft on WCPT 820. Hey, and I'm back and I'm talking to Saru about one of the most, I, I want to say, painful um, uh, dichotomies of power in, in, in our country. And there are lots of them, but I'm just imagining, and I don't think I can have the stomach for it anymore, going to a restaurant, having someone serve the food. To, to me, my family, to a dozen other people, and then have to go get food stamps to feed himself or, or herself and her family. And, and Saru, is it, is it true that people in the industry are twice as likely to need food stamps as the rest of the workforce? In some states, it's as bad as three times as likely workers in this industry. I mean, you're talking about an industry of mostly women, disproportionately single mothers, who are trying to make ends meet on the vagaries of tips, as we talked about. Yep. And so what, what does that result in? That results in $9 billion that restaurant workers in America use in taxpayer-funded public assistance each year. The average Olive Garden costs the taxpayer a quarter million dollars a year in taxpayer-funded public assistance. So you know what that means? That means that we as customers and the public are subsidizing multi-billion dollar corporations in two ways. One, by paying four-fifths of their workers' wages, four-fifths of their workers' wages with our tips. And two, because that still isn't enough to live on, we are also subsidizing their workers' survival through our taxpayer-funded public assistance programs because workers can't make it. It's not that they want to be on public assistance. It's that they have no choice. Yeah, and, and subsidizing corporate America is not is not new or unique to this industry, but it's a right. right it's appalling. Um, yeah. And th this latest um, move, where people are voting with their feet, saying "I'm not coming back," right? Go, I'm I'm going yeah. somewhere else. They're finding other jobs, and yet I hear from conservatives who say, "You see, the government's just paying people not to work." Well, the insanity of that, and just it's heartbreaking, is that when the pandemic shut down the industry last March, we started a relief fund for these workers. So 250,000 workers applied for relief, and 63%, that's two-thirds of the workers, told us they couldn't actually get unemployment insurance because in most states, including Illinois, they were told their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. They were told in so many states, wow, your wage is three, four, five, six dollars an hour. It looks like you didn't actually work full time. It looks like you worked part time. I, I had a, a woman from Michigan say, I, I reported my tips to the IRS so religiously, diligently, but because my employer never reported my tips when I went to go apply, they said, it looks like you're just earning that $3 Michigan wage. You didn't work enough to make, to qualify for benefits. So the hilariousness of people saying, oh, they're staying home collecting unemployment insurance is that the vast majority of these workers reported to us that they never got it in the first place. Now, now when that happened, when so many workers were told you earn too little to get unemployment insurance, it was like a light bulb went off on top of like millions of workers' heads saying, wait a second, if the government's telling me I'm earning too little to get benefits, probably I'm earning too little. And I should leave this industry, and they did. Yeah. They left in the millions last year 
and we just did a survey of workers who are still left in the industry because so many have left. Of those that remain, 54% say they're leaving, 78% say the only thing that's going to make them stay or come back is a full livable wage with tips on top. So you're absolutely right. They are voting with their feet and it has nothing to do with unemployment insurance. They mostly never got it. I, I, I think you're making progress. Tell me about what just happened in New York State. Is I'm confused. I think they are about to pass or just passed a law that impacts food delivery workers not in the restaurant, but like the door dashes of the world. And I can't tell if that's progress or the kind of step in the right direction that actually forestalls larger and more important change. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's definitely progress. That was at the city level, New York City level, and that was the result of amazing organizing by those delivery workers and their, and, and, and you know, or professional organizers that worked with them. It was it was a really incredible victory. Um, it doesn't guarantee those workers the equivalent of a full minimum wage. And in fact, if those delivery workers, the Ubers and the Lyft workers or DoorDash, Instacart workers, were to actually be, if those companies were forced to give them the minimum wage, because New York State, like Illinois and many other states, allows for a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, those workers would get a sub-minimum wage. Yeah. Because those companies, Uber, Lyft, Instacart, DoorDash, in the last several years have attempted to emulate the restaurant industry saying, oh, they get tipped, we can pay them less. And so as long as we have a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, or frankly any sub-minimum wage in the U.S., it's going to continue to grow. Because if one industry has it, other industries are going to want the same boondoggle. Oh, I shouldn't have to pay for my workers either. I, I so think, though, so, and all sub-minimum wages. You're on the cusp of winning, and and I mean, people are learning about. I mean, part because the industry is so big, almost everyone knows someone who works in this industry. One in two Americans has worked in this industry yeah. at some point in the. So so yeah. so I mean, I'm I'm thinking about giant social change that's happened in my lifetime, and um, possibly the biggest is around gay marriage. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the entire change there happened when, when very brave individuals raised their hands to their families and friends and said, hey, I got something to tell you about me. And the love they had for their families is what, what began to change America's thinking um, in, a, in a remarkable way. And I think it, you have encouraged restaurant workers people who work on a sub-minimum wage to tell their story in a way that's going to resonate and make a difference. Um, we have little time left. Can you tell our audience how they can help you, how they can get involved, how they can be part of this change? Yes, well, you're so right that we are on the cusp of huge change. We're already seeing so many restaurants that have switched to paying a full minimum wage. So there's really three things we need people to do. One is that there's a bill moving in Congress called the Raise the Wage Act. Uh, it would raise the minimum wage in the U.S. to 15 and fully phase out the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers and workers with disabilities. We need everybody to actually call your senator, your congress member, and say, we uh, this has to be the highest priority. We have to get this across the finish line. It is just uh, massively important that we raise this wage and end the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. That's one. And you can do that by going to onefairwage.org. That's our website and hitting take action, and it'll take you straight to how you can send a note or call your legislator. That's one. Two, uh, in your state, there's likely a bill moving to end the sub minimum wage for tipped workers because there's these bills exist in lots of states. You're right, we're on the cusp of winning in New York State and, and many other states. So uh, if you're in Illinois, wherever you are, call your state legislators and your governors and do the same. Tell them we need to end the sub minimum wage for tipped workers. And the third thing is support the restaurants that are actually paying the full minimum wage, you can find the list at highroadrestaurants.org. Um, but also, more importantly, wherever you eat out, tell your restaurant owner manager, not the workers, they don't have the power, go up to the manager or the owner at the end of your meal and say, hey, I love the food, I love the service, but I want to see you paying a full minimum wage. That is so important to me. I want to keep coming here so you better change it. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining me today and thank you so much for the work you're doing on behalf of what one in ten americans 
It's an, <laughs> one in ten working Americans. One in ten working really Americans. Good. Amazing. Amazing work, Saru. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Saturday. Yep. Okay, well, uh, that is a national issue of huge import to many people and um, very important to Chicago. But uh, we have a lot going on in Chicago um, uh, in addition to supporting everybody who works in this industry, including a budget, including uh, new maps, including all kinds of issues of policing and security. But we also don't know each other in the city that well as we should. And I want to talk to one of our aldermen about all of that. Alderman Villegas is joining us. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, good afternoon. Hi there. You know, having once uh, been in your in your uh, profession, I love talking to aldermen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know firsthand exactly what it is that uh, an alderman has to go through, so we appreciate your service to the city of Chicago. So before we get into the city of Chicago and all those issues, can you tell all the listeners, and the signal here reaches, you know, from Michigan to Wisconsin, includes parts of Indiana, so... Tell everybody about your ward. Tell them something about its character, the best restaurants, the most beautiful parks, what concerns your residents have. Just talk about the ward first. Absolutely. So I have the the pleasure of serving uh, the 36th ward, which is on the northwest side of the city, which is encompassed of uh, parts of five communities, the Belmont Cragen community, Hermosa, Montclair, Dunning, and Portage Park. So I've, I have uh, five parts of those uh, those communities. Uh, some of the best restaurants, uh, we have uh, Paretta's Italian Food in Portage Park. We have uh, Le Cuba uh, in the Belmont Cragen community, which is Cuban food restaurant. Uh, and then uh, El Mason's, uh, which is a, uh, a Mexican restaurant, which has fantastic uh, grilled steak, uh, tacos, and, and, and toltas. Uh, and then we also have uh, Hands of Thai, which is a, a Thai Thai food. So I'm a foodie, so I love, I love visiting restaurants, not only in my ward, but throughout the city. Because uh, uh, we we definitely are the the culinary capital of of, uh, of the world. Uh, some of the issues that are that my residents are concerned with are not they're similar to most residents in the city of Chicago, uh, which is uh, public safety, uh, taxes, uh, and then also education yep. school system. Yep. So those are the three three pressing issues that my constituents continuously are uh, talking to to me and and. and really my colleagues to uh, uh, I, I'd like to dig into those a little with, with sort of the budget and some other things as background, but I have one more question about the ward. Back in the yeah. day when, when I was an alderman, um, the Banks family was very much uh, in evidence um, uh, as alderman and, and uh, in and around the ward, and I'm just wondering if, if a change from sort of a, a one... Uh, kind of leadership to another has made a difference in the community in the sense, is there more activism than there was? Are residents more engaged in these issues than they were? Is, is that happening? Yeah, and so um, uh, the um, 36th Ward, uh, we had uh, Alderman Banks, and then after him, Alderman Rice. And, all this yep. um, and, uh, and, and with, with, those, with those three aldermen before that, um, I, again, I've had the pleasure of serving uh, for six years now, um, I ran unopposed in 2019. So they renewed my, my constituents renewed my contract for another four years. Yep. Uh, and that was, and that was very humbling because, uh, I heard from my constituents that, um, you know, that they've experienced some of the best service ever. And these are from long standing constituents have been in the community 30, 40 years. So again, that's very humbling. Um, they have, they have, um, gotten a lot more, uh, vocal about issues, and, and, and we can equate that to lots of social media because uh, whether it's through Facebook or through Twitter, mm-hmm. which I'm very active on, well, my constituents are able to reach me, and I appreciate that because uh, with almost uh, with almost 60,000 people in the ward, it's hard to, to know what's going on on a specific block at any time of the day unless my constituents are notifying our office of what's transpiring there. So I appreciate the communication between my constituents and my office. Uh, so social media has definitely helped uh, get my be able to get my message out, but also receive issues that are plaguing the community. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't understand people who think aldermen don't work harder than almost everybody else. 
you are right there with everyone <clears throat> and trying to advocate in a city um, and all bureaucracies. I don't know, I'm not blaming the mayor, the current mayor for this, or any mayor. All bureaucracies have their own agenda a little bit, and it's different than the agenda of an alderman who's got actual constituents yelling at him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know, our office. Well, actually, local local elected officials are always the ones they can reach out and touch. And so, yep. uh, I remember during the last presidential term, where, where people were telling me, "Well, we need you to tell Trump, you know, X Y Z," and I'm like, "Well, I could tweet him. I don't have access to him, so you may have to, you know, talk to your U.S. senator or congressman." Uh, but we, we always try to help out the constituents, regardless of the level of government that we serve. So. Um Lots to talk about. Let's just, the budget was introduced this week. Yes. Um, and I know that, and now I think much of Chicago has heard, that you introduced a guaranteed minimum income pilot maybe way back in April, if I'm right. And now there's one in That's the right. budget. Does that mean you're being heard? Well, I, well, I would say yes that uh, the community groups that, that were advocating for this um, and, um, and our office bringing this up, um, we've been heard. But I guess what's really frustrating is a couple of things is that, you know, this was brought up back in, uh, I started talking about this in February, had some hearings on it in March, and then introduced an a uh, ordinance in April uh, based on the hearings. And uh, we, we, let, we had a lot, lot of subject matter experts from throughout the, throughout the um the country that have, that have done this type of program. So we were looking at best practices. And so as a result of that, we rolled out something that we thought uh, was a, uh, a good ordinance. And uh, I brought it to the mayor initially uh, to say, hey, this is something that I think we should definitely, we should definitely take a look at. And based on uh, some of the funding that was paid for this guaranteed basic income through the CARES Act, which the ARP money would be similar with the treasury rules, we thought this would be like a no-brainer. Uh, and mayor was the mayor was um, not not uh, supportive of it, and so um, that's the frustrating part. Is that my well, she's come around on this? Well, she's come around now, which is good. Better late, better late than never. But what the problem is is that you know we we've got we we've kind of had a pilot uh, already going um, because people are hurting. Yeah. The intent of the American Rescue Plan is to help re rescue people from from the uh, and, and have them recover from the pandemic. So, well, uh, right. Pilot, the, so, pilot, a pilot. Uh, uh, th this was an idea. I mean, the Nixon administration came very close to passing a guaranteed minimum income plan for the whole country, and then he and then he walked away from it. Um, so, gotcha. this is not a new idea in America. No, no, no. By by no means is it a. A new, a new idea. This is something that Martin Luther King talked about yep. back in the '60s. Yep. Uh, but in, in Chicago, it is, it is, a, it is a new idea because it's the first ordinance that was, that's been proposed. Right. So, so as I tell people, we we can talk about things, but until you put pen to paper, that's when you have, that's when you start to really make. How would it work? Who decides who the 500 families are? Well, actually, it's 5,000 families. 5,000. Well, uh, okay. Who, yeah. who decides who the 5,000 are? So the 5,000 families, we would take a look at some criteria related to uh, the uh, federal po poverty level. Uh, we would take a look at, I had put in there, uh, returning citizens would be al allowed to participate. Uh -huh. uh, and anyone, regardless of your immigration status, would be allowed to participate mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, if you were, if you were um, a participant of, um, of a reparations program that would not, that would not, um, uh, it would still allow you to participate in the program. Um, this this program would be pretty pretty much geared towards uh, CPS parents, um, single moms that um, that are struggling. And I think this type of program, and I speak I speak about this type of program um, with with with, uh, with a life experience because my, my my I'm a product of a pro, of a pro, of a program similar to this called survival death benefits. Mm -hmm. Social Security. Mm -hmm. So when my dad when my dad died when I was eight years old, my mom found herself in a position of having to raise two boys, mm -hmm. and so she she worked, but she, we got a stipend on a monthly basis until I was eighteen, uh, and as a result of that investment by the federal government, uh, that allowed her to continue working, have a four child care in the early years, and then on the out years, it allowed us to move to uh, communities that were a lot more um, safer than where we where we currently were living. 
Yeah, got the country a U.S. Marine, too. Yeah, and have two of them, because my brother uh, was served in the Marines as well. Huh. And, 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 and we both are we've been taxpayers since we were 18, so we paid back our, our investment uh, for the federal government at least four or five-fold. Yep. Um, and, but we know that these types of investments in human infrastructure work, too. And uh, that's why, that's why uh, uh, I've been pushing it. I, I think there's a lot of data that supports that, and, and more and more of it as these pilots are being tested around the country. Yes, yes, and and with a larger with a larger five thousand person pool, I think we'll get some some really good data that we can share throughout the country as to what are some of the best practices, what are things that are working, uh, and where can we improve on it. No, so in Stockton, Stockton was one hundred and twenty five people. Right. Uh, in Minnesota, they had uh, five hundred, but with five thousand, yeah, it'd be a good experiment. Country. Yeah. So so. Um uh, what department is going to be charged with managing this program? Right. So we thought initially the Department of Finance might make sense. Uh, and then also, um, it, so we, we thought the Department of Finance would make sense. But that's something that we would you know, work out with the administration as to how they figured they want to roll this out. Uh, and then we also took a look at um, utilizing the city, the city's um, uh, ID key. The, the city ID, yep. the city key yep. uh, ID, yep. which um, would allow for um, folks to uh, have the money on that uh, ID card, and then we can track the spending to f- kind of find out what the habits are of the folks that are receiving it, and then try to work with philanthropic corporations, not-for-profits, uh, after the pilot's over to figure out how to continue a program uh, moving forward. So so is the, is the money uh, for this is in... The proposed budget. So it doesn't say what department has that money in the budget. Uh, I have no. It's just it just mentioned. I, it was it was a little short on details as to uh, how the how the pilot was going to uh, actually be implemented. Yeah, it was just m- more announced that it was. Uh, that it would be there. Okay. I yeah. I, I yeah. have. Um, look, I want to I want to get your take on this, and I I uh, f- yeah, I'm going to. St- ask the question and and ask for forgiveness for asking it later but there are a lot of people who now a couple years into the administration just they don't worry so much about the things that the city wants to do they worry about the talent to get it done they just worry about uh, uh, you know okay we've said we're gonna do this kind of policing we don't always see it we've said just there's an implementation question around the competence to get things done how can we be sure that this program and so many others that have been announced um, in a very big budget will be well managed that will be that this pilot um, will generate great data that we can use then for policy setting all around the country that the funds will go where they should go and they'll go to the right families. I mean, how do we know that the, that the talent and the infrastructure is there in the city to do all the things that are on offer? Yeah. That, that's a, that's a fair question. Cause when you saw the budget, there was a lot of funding for different types of programs. So again, that would be a a lot. probably that. <laughs> yeah. So that would be a question that the administration would have to figure out as to how they envision who are the partners that they're, that they're working with. I hope that we're not just looking at um, utilizing our current staff uh, in order to uh, try to implement some of these programs just because, they're, first of all, they're not sustainable. Programs aren't sustainable, so we, I don't want to be hiring someone for a one-year program and afterwards having to let them go because there's no, not any work. But I think there's not-for-profits out there and other entities that we could probably lean on to try to get some type of uh, guidance and assistance from. So I hope that that's what the, the administration is thinking about. But so a lot of delegation, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, that, that's something that the administration would have to respond to as to how they envision rolling out uh, all the programs that they've um, laid out in the budget. I, believe me, I'm going I'm to ask. <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. going to ask. Um, and uh, But there's one particular one that affects Alderman, right? There's a hundred... There's a... A proposal that each alderman will be able to uh, grant money and sort of micro loans in, in your ward. Yeah, hundred thousand dollar micro grants. Yeah, uh, for yeah, businesses. And and 
I don't know who brought that forward from the uh, council members. Um, and so I'll have to ask them what, what their, what the Genesis was for that. But, uh, first of all, a hundred thousand dollars is not a lot of money. Uh, quite frankly, some of these business quarters, uh, you know, specifically in, in some of the south and west sides of the city would definitely need more of an investments. And uh, I know for a fact that I would need a, a lot more uh, in order to do that because we got to make sure that not only are we uh, helping uh, business quarters, but those that are existing already, making sure that they have the investments uh, and the capital necessary to keep them thriving as well. Yeah, I, but I don't understand. I don't understand the mechanism. Again, I don't want to go too much in the weeds, but I've heard a lot in the last few years that the city council should be legislators, not administrators. So, so don't tell me where we should put a sign, right? Because you know, just just pass policies for the city. Now, please administer this particular pot of money with what guidance? I mean, it, I, again, I you know, it's the kind of thing that sends aldermen to jail. Give them a hundred grand and say spend it. W- what kind of guidance? Do you have what kind of protections do you have that you'll be yeah. doing something that isn't going to cause uh, the feds to be saying, yeah. Yeah, "Hey, I got a new crop." <laughs> no, no. So, so right now, that's a that's a question that was posed during the budget hearings. Yep. And uh, well, what kind of answer did you get? We have we got a response that you you, you would appreciate, uh, Edwin. Is we'll get that answer through. We we'll, we we'll get that answer to you through the chair, which means that uh, they're punting. They're punting because they. They don't have the. They don't have all the. Yeah, I, I, just me talking here, but I saw a lot of stuff that I like in this budget, um, but I didn't see the stuff that turns the things I like into real things. Yeah, right. Yeah. So a lot of it. A lot of it is, again, and the, the mayor introduces a budget, and you have fifty uh, different opinions um, on a, how a budget should work. So a lot. A lot of this uh, discussions will be ongoing for the next two weeks. Uh, and you'll see some other ideas that come forward. I mean, um, I think I think right now to, to talk about the uh, the uh, the CPI, which is the Consumer yep. Price Index, yep. right? I think it's a mistake right now because there's funding uh, that we give CPS uh, in the form of pension uh, payback that we could probably divert, keep in our budget, and then have them use some of their ARP money to offset some of those other costs. Just so we're clear, uh, so, because I, you, you went quickly here, and I'm not sure everybody knows what you're saying. Yeah, you're saying sorry. that the automatic increase to the tax levy, to property taxes for people, may not be something that you want to go down that road right now. No, I think I think people are still people are still trying to recover. Yeah, they're hurting uh, for the pandemic. Yep. Uh, I mean, I was I was, and I get that. I was, I was one of the five aldermen that did not take the, the pay raise because I I understand that it, it's just the optics don't look don't look good, and so. Yep. We have to we have to share uh, in that pain with uh, with our with our constituents, uh, and uh, and quite frankly, if if you're uh, making over a hundred thousand um, dollars in some of the neighborhood wards, um, which is almost in some cases two or two and a half times the median household income, and you can't make it, then you have a problem with accounting in your yeah, house. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's a personal decision that you know some of the aldermen did, uh, yep. take, and that's their that's their response that's their um, responsibility. Um, I, uh, I didn't see any money and I could have missed it in the map for a, for the board of elections to run a referendum on a ward remap. You guys must be pretty sure you can draft a map that gets enough votes. I think that, um, I think that, um, you know, the the, the number one thing that has to happen in politics is just, uh, communication. Uh, and then the willingness to, to come to a compromise. And I think that um, there is an opportunity there. Uh, but as you stated, we are legislators. We, we can go ahead and always appropriate some additional funding yeah. if we have to. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, and, and, and plus because the referendum would be conducted in June of next year. So there is still ample time, time. to provide yep. funding for that. Yeah. But uh, I guess the hope, our hope is that we will come to some type of compromise uh, and try to get the 41 votes needed. I know we can get there, but there has to be real negotiations that, that are, and real conversations that are going to have to take place. Uh, just set the table for everybody. I, you and I are, because we're both in this world, <clears throat> I'm not sure everybody understands. Tell everybody about the census data and what that means for maps and the kinds of issues yeah. that, that you're thinking about as you go in the room for those negotiations. Well, I think, you know, so every 10 years, uh, we're, we're required, and 
I'm, I'm, I'm close to the airport, so I apologize. The airplane is flying on, which is good because it means people are coming, uh, coming in because these are inbound flights, uh, not outbound flights. Like so. that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, every 10 years are required by law to reapportion the maps uh, in accordance with the census. And so the census results came in, and as a result of that, uh, showed that the city of Chicago did actually have an increase in population, uh, which is good news. Great prior news. To, great, great. Yeah, prior to, prior to, the, uh, the, to the new, to the set, final numbers coming in, there was some concern that the city would be losing population. So I'm glad the, the sky wasn't falling. Um, so we we um, have to go have to reapportion the maps, and um, and uh, we have to take into account the data, the Voting Rights Act, and then what also people um, want to see as it relates to to the ward uh, and to the wards. So right now, um, population in Chicago is approximately 31 percent Caucasian, 30 percent Latino, 29 percent African American, and about seven percent Asian. And um, and so, as a result of that, um, we're going to have to try to make wards that are kind of reflective of the city's population. And so we've begun that process now. Now that we have the data, um, we're taking a look at you know the utilization of software in order to draw the draw mm-hmm. the wards, mm-hmm. uh, making sure that we're trying to make them as compact as possible, contingent uh, continuous as possible, in accordance with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and so th- that's the process that we're in right now. Right. And t- but today's uh, th- the boundaries that are drawn today result in wards whose um, representation does not look like 31, 30, 29, 7. I mean, right? The, Correct. And, yes. And, and so really um, the, the, the growth in the Latinx community is leading to some questions about, hey, wait a minute, you know what, they're more... There are more black wards than there are people, and we're going to have to do something about that. Well, I, I, I would say that um, I, I wouldn't signal out anyone. I would say that we feel that the Latino community is underrepresented in the form of wards. So our job is going to be to figure a way to get to a portion that's reflective of the population. Yep. Uh, in accordance with the data, the Voting Rights Act, and what people want to see in yep. their ward. Yep. Yeah, and keeping communities together has been hard, and God knows there's some very bizarrely drawn wards right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, and you, and it's so ironic too, because Edwin, the the uh, the city is perfectly set up in a grid format. Yeah, so you would think that it would just be like, hey, from North Avenue to Irving and Ashland to Pulaski, that's a ward, but it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, man, particularly not if your name's Bob Fioretti. <laughs> oh yeah, that was that was a tough. Uh, that was a disaster right there. All right, so let me ask you a, a slightly different question going to the committee you chair. Yes. <clears throat> which is, I think, um, economic capital and technology development. Yes. So, so I, is that the committee that gets the data from the big um, uh, uh, real estate development projects that make deals with the city about hiring, and you get to see how they've done? Like Lincoln Yards so, um, made some deals about who they were hiring. Uh, in the form of hi- hiring contractors or workers? Or yeah, in the form of they were hi- the, the, the certain number of hires would be city residents, and there would be... Oh, yeah. yeah so so how, you know, how's that going? Are, are you able to hold them to account, and are you seeing the kind of hiring that, that the city wanted to see? So right now, Lincoln Yards really hasn't started yet. Yep. Um, so, so, so there will there will be uh, an announcement of a project, project starting uh, uh, sometime this month or early next month. Uh, so we will be will be watching those numbers because I think it's important when you have a majority minority uh, city council, uh, and those are some of the questions that we're always constantly posing as to making sure that communities are participating in these mega projects. Uh, we definitely um, definitely 100 percent pro economic development creates jobs, uh, but we want to make sure that everyone's participating. And so you better believe that with 32 members of the city council out of 50 that are African-American and Latino, that we want to make sure that uh, our communities are participating in these projects. Yeah, and every alderman has to want city residents spending money in the city, right? Earning money and spending it here in the city, not 
earning money here and spending it out in Bolingbrook. Well, and now uh, Bolingbrook, or in some cases, uh, taking it out of state, right? So we don't right. want to be the Indiana stimulus package. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, folks from the Chicago, at least 50 percent, are participating on these projects in the surrounding suburbs. So that way, we're keeping the money in the Chicagoland metro area in the region, uh, which better which better helps uh, Illinois' financial uh, outlook. really important and that's going right through your committee it's a big big important job and it only happens because um, you know after many years the city finally has decided that they will hold people accountable for this they'll actually get the data that allow you to hold people accountable for it yeah and and that's what we're working on is hold, holding uh, the department of planning accountable making sure that they're holding the contractors accountable as well so on an annual basis throughout the duration of any type of tax incentive, they need to, they need to report to my committee as to what the, uh, what the uh, um, attainment is yep. throughout the duration of their project. So yep. that's going to be key, and that's, that's legislation that I introduced and got passed with my colleagues. So well, congratulations. It's real, really, impo- really important stuff. Really important. Thank you. All right, we have you know two more minutes left, you and I. Is there a topic that you wanted to make sure everybody hears that we haven't talked about? No, I think you've pretty much hit everything. I mean, this is this is a, a budget process that's just starting. And as I stated, the mayor has proposed our budget. We have 50 different opinions as to what our priorities for um, different uh, communities. But we definitely want to make sure that um, we we don't we don't mess up this once in a lifetime opportunity uh, with the ARP money. Um, it's a 1.9 billion dollar windfall that uh, the city of Chicago has received. And I can tell you that this has never happened before. Yeah. And so I think it's imperative that we don't, we don't squander this opportunity uh, and make sure that we're making some good sound investments um, for the future. Yeah, I'm so, going to uh, beg you as a citizen, you know, yes. in, in, in the national uh, realm, there are, there's a party now that, that is in fantasy land. They're telling people to drink horse medicine. They don't, Really, they want to un- undermine voting and undermine the democracy, have some kind of bizarre minority rule, and that's a huge fight. The entire burden of governing falls on Democrats now, <clears throat> the entire yeah. burden. So it's important all over the country that we are able to set aside the the fights that it's easy to have when you have 90% agreement on what to do and go to war on the last 10%. I, I beg you, and I'm going to beg everyone in the city council to come together and get a good, solid budget that protects his taxpayers and is good for the city through this process so that we don't, so that not only is it great for us, but that we don't give any ammunition to the people in the rest of the country who look at Chicago and point at us and point out every bad thing we do as a, as a reason why somehow it's okay to run the crazy policies of the right. Yeah, and you have my word on that. I, uh, I'm, I'm a person that understands compromise and negotiations, and I realize that if you if you propose something and you get 30 or 40 percent of what you propose, then you're moving the ball down the field, and those are wins. And I think that people need to understand that that whatever's proposed uh, would be awesome to get the full proposal, but if you get like I said, 30, 40 percent of what you're proposing. Uh, and um, and then you can go back, come back the next year and try for another 30 or 40. Yeah. Next thing you know, you have, you have 100% of what you propose. Well, and, you know, doing a major uh, nation-leading um, uh, guaranteed wage experiment here is a really big deal. So congratulations. Yes. I'll be stopping at either El Mason or Pareto's, and I'll let you know. <laughs> Oh, I found awesome. <laughs> well, let me know. Let me know when you're coming, and, and I'll and I'll hook up with you. Oh, terrific! Listen, thank you for your time. I appreciate getting some of your Saturday. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to be back with another former alderman, Marty Oberman. But he has an enormous and important job uh, having to do with every rail car in the country. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. NBC News Radio, I'm Michael Kastner. Key border crossing in Texas is partially reopening today after federal authorities closed a massive Haitian migrant camp. 
As many as 14,000 migrants, mostly from Haiti, had been camped out beneath a border crossing near Del Rio, Texas, hoping for asylum. The camp was cleared out and makeshift shelters were bulldozed to the ground. The Department of Homeland Security says about 2,000 migrants were deported and about 5,000 are being processed. The rest returned to Mexico or were released into the U.S., under the asylum process. President Biden is condemning images of Border Patrol agents on horseback confronting the refugees on the southern border. Brian Shook reports. During a White House news conference, Biden called the images horrible and said there will be consequences. He also called it embarrassing, dangerous, and wrong. Biden said such images send the wrong messages to the U.S. and the world. Gabby Petito's funeral is this Sunday in Long Island, New York. Petito's father made the announcement yesterday. Public visitation will be from noon until 5 p.m. in Holbrook, New York. Her father asked those who wish to send flowers to instead consider making a donation to the Gabby Petito Foundation that is in the process of being set up. The no-fly list for Delta is growing. Sarah Bartlett with that story. The Atlanta-based airline has added 1,600 names, including 600 unruly passengers this year alone. Reports of rage on flights has dramatically increased during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially when it comes to wearing a face mask. The Tony Awards are returning this Sunday after being postponed last year due to the pandemic. No matter your sin. Moulin Rouge is a critic favorite to take home the best musical Tony. The ceremony, which usually takes place at Radio City Music Hall in New York City, will be broadcast from the Winter Garden Theater in front of a live audience. All guests will need to provide proof of vaccination in order to attend. Michael Kastner, NBC News Radio. Joan Esposito, live local and progressive on WCPT Willow Springs, is powered by ComEd. Lower your energy bills and reduce your carbon footprint with the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program. Wouldn't it be great to have big, beautiful waves? The Conair Double Ceramic Waver makes it easy with three barrels for deep, continuous waves. Double Ceramic ensures even heat, so you style fast and your waves last. To order, go to conair.com and search Waver now. And for complete rules and details on how you could win $2,500, plus fantastic products from Conair in the Back to Beauty sweepstakes, go to conairbacktobeauty.com. That's conairbacktobeauty.com. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. <laughs> Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code TIME for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code TIME for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code TIME. This is WCPT 820, where facts matter. You're looking at the big picture with Edwin Eisentraff on WCPT 820. Hey, and we're back at 773-763-9278. I'm going to talk to former alderman and Surface Transportation Board Chair Marty Oberman, and afterwards I'm going to talk to you and take your calls. So feel free to call 773 763 Nine two seven eight. Hello, Marty. Edwin, good to talk to you. Good to talk and to congratulations. you. Congratulations, congratulations on this show. Thank I you. It's great. So, I before we uh, get you into probably, what you probably don't know about me is that when I was seventeen, I was a disc jockey. So you're fo- you're following in my footsteps again. Again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so so um, go ahead. So so um, and people, I just don't know if everybody knows this. Marty and I were both aldermen of the same ward. Not at the same time, but we we had the pleasure of serving the same constituents. And Marty and I are also a cautionary tale for Democrats all over the country, because although we're not ancient, we're not young men anymore. And and when we were much younger, Marty and I agreed on every big thing. 
every big important issue we agreed on, but not so much on the small stuff. And we fought like dogs over, over the little stuff, which is um, a lesson for Democrats right now when the entire burden of governing falls on Democrats. We just have to get the stuff done that needs to be done. So, Edward, in my uh, new role, I'm not supposed to jump right into partisan fights, but I have to agree with 100% with what you said. Yeah, it, we have... Going forward. There's, th- right? right? There's only one party that's taking governing seriously, and we don't have time for the stuff that we don't have time for. So, let's right. let's talk about what you've become an expert in. You, you, you were appointed to the Metro Board in 2013 and then to the Surface Transportation Board. And in the crazy world we live in, it just goes to show that Donald Trump's appointments weren't all nuts. He couldn't help but approve <laughs> you for this job because it came out of our, our legislative leaders in the, in the state. And there it is. But tell everybody what the board is. Uh, well, let me uh, say a couple of things, by the way. This board, like many of the regulatory agencies in Washington, the Federal Communications Commission, the SEC, and so forth, is by statute bipartisan. Right. So there can can be no more than a majority from the same party. So there was a Democratic opening that I was appointed to. And uh, the process, by the way, your uh, listeners might be interested in knowing, I, I learned, is a customary one where the senior... A, par- a person in the party out of the White House makes the pick. It doesn't have to be. The president could just say, I'm going to declare so-and-so a Democrat and put him on there. But even the Trump White House followed that custom, and I was actually promoted for this position by Senator Schumer, uh, but with a lot of support from uh, the home, you know, from yep. Senator Durbin yep. and Senator Duckworth and so forth. So that's how it happened. So your listeners may probably be more familiar with the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was is the was the grandfather of all regulatory agencies, it was the first one ever in the history of our country, created in 1887. In 1995, as part of a continuing effort to deregulate a number of industries, airlines, railroads, and so forth, the Congress abolished the Interstate Commerce Commission and replaced it with this board, the Surface Transportation Board. Mm-hmm. Um, it has far less um, detailed regulatory authority over the railroad industry than the old uh, ICC had, and that's appropriate. If the uh, e- even I, I think there's a un- unanimity and agreement in Washington that the, the railroads were overregulated up through the 70s and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. early 80s, um, and this board has uh, five members now. Uh, currently, because we have uh, uh, the legacy of the Trump administration. There are three Republicans and two Democrats, but one of those Republican terms will expire at the end of this year. And there's a Democrat who's been approved by the Senate Commerce Committee awaiting full Senate confirmation. So eventually it'll switch to three Democrats, two Republicans. Mm-hmm. But picking up on the theme that you started with, one thing I'm happy to say has been my experience since I've been on the board, which is two and a half years now, is that we really are a nonpartisan operation. The Democrats and the Republicans on the board work extraordinarily well together. None of us are ideologues or rigid in our views. Yes, some are more conservative in our general outlook on life than others, but I would say all of us are pragmatists, and uh, we really have a very collegial working relationship that bears no resemblance to what we see in most parts of Washington, particularly in Congress. So that that's very healthy. Very healthy. Uh, and anyway, it, important, yeah. Marty, just for people to understand that government work is hard work, and there are serious people who are engaged in that work, and it is it, it doesn't always break down in a partisan way. It's just work. <laughs> it has to get done. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, that's really an important point, Edwin. And we have a staff of about 125 people, mostly lawyers and economists, many of them have been there for a number of years on both sides of the aisle Mm -hmm. in the White House. And it is a very professional, hardworking board. I'm I'm delighted to find that there uh, when I got there. Um, And we do work hard. So to get to the um, other aspect of your question, what do we do? So we are charged with the economic regulation of the entire freight rail industry and a little bit of the passenger rail industry. 
So when it comes to disputes between shippers and railroads over the rates that are being charged, we resolve those disputes. Disputes. We have uh, total jurisdiction over railroad mergers, so railroads cannot merge without bringing uh, their case to us. And they're very complex cases. We have one pending now, and we have to say up or, up or down. Uh, it's a very, very intense amount of work. People should know, uh, you know, I, I, uh, and I'm one who wasn't all that familiar with the magnitude of the railroad industry uh, before I joined Metro and now the STB. Uh, about 30 to 40 percent of our economy uh, rests on the railroad, stuff that's moved on railroads. So it is a fundamental industry to the well-being of the country. And um, having it run effectively, economically, with fair rates, because if rates are too high, they not only affect shippers, uh, then those rates end up getting, in many cases, passed on to consumers. Mm -hmm. Uh, having the railroads run on time and get product to where it's supposed to be, particularly now in the middle of this, you know, ship the worldwide uh, shipping blockade problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's very important work, and that's where we come in. We also are the place where disputes between Amtrak and the freight railroads are brought. So, oh, what a nightmare. Uh, yeah, well, they don't bring them that often, interestingly right. enough, but... <laughs> Vir virtually all of Amtrak runs on freight railroad tracks, except in the Northeast between Washington and uh, Boston. Right. And by law, freight railroads are required to give uh, preference to Amtrak trains. In other words, uh, when two trains meet, it's the freight that's supposed to pull over onto the siding uh, and let Amtrak pass. That's an oversimplification, but that does happen. And they frequently do not give that preference, and those <laughs> kinds of disputes are, are brought to us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so that that's what we do, and we it's hard. It is detailed. The law in in this area is very arcane. The facts are complex. It's fascinating, uh, intellectually challenging, uh, hard work. Now, part of the Biden agenda has been to at least raise uh, expectations around the ability to limit monopolies wherever they are because, on the theory that uh, better competition is good for everybody and that there's been a, a, a concentration of power in a bunch of industries. And you mentioned um, uh, that you guys oversee and have to approve mergers. Uh, this so this has got to play uh, out me, in front of you. Yes, absolutely. And let me uh, put up and uh, make sure I lay forth the premise here. By statute, the STB, like a number of other agencies, is an independent agency, meaning it's not directly a part of the executive branch. Okay. So in other words, the, pre the president can't give us an order and say you must do X or Y the yep. way the president could say yep. to the Department of Justice. Yep. Um, Nevertheless, um, you know, we're cognizant of national policy. Now, in, in, in this case, the happy circumstance is that my own views of the railroad industry, and I think most of the members of the board, uh, coincide with what the Biden administration is saying. So there's no conflict there. Um, and I have to say this because the board members and the board staff cherish that independence. And I know a lot of people said, well, we're doing what we do now just because the president ordered it, and it's not that at all. In fact, we were worried about competition long while Trump was president and was not giving any such direction. Yep. So yep. to put this in the railroad industry industry's context, um, and I'm sure many of you, only listeners my age, I think, would remember that back before 1980, there were 40 to 50 large railroads throughout the country. We classify railroads by size, and they're the class ones, you know, the New York Central mm -hmm. and uh, Rock Island, so forth, Santa Fe. Uh, one of the things that Congress did when it began to deregulate in 1980 was to make it easier for railroads to merge, because the truth is the country was overbuilt from the mid-19th century. There were just too many railroads, diluting each other's ability to function profitably and be healthy. 
So the Congress correctly, I think, made it easier for railroads to merge. And there was a huge wave of mergers up through 2000. So that 40 to 50 large railroads is now only seven in the North American continent, two of which are Canadian, the Canadian National, Canadian yep. Pacific. There are only five in the United States. And in 2000, the then STB enacted a moratorium on mergers because for the same reason that there was too much concentration of power, they then changed the merger rules going forward and, and you can now have mergers, but it is, there are many more hurdles to get one approved. Mm -hmm. So, so in terms of further railroad mergers, and there is the first big proposed merger in 20 years is now on our plate. Uh, there's an effort by Canadian Pacific to buy the smallest of the big railroads, Kansas City Southern, and we uh, we have to scrutinize that. And I can't talk about the merits of it because it's a pending case. Well, um, Marty, hold on one second. Yes, we, yeah, so, yeah. Let me interrupt you a second. Today's Wall Street Journal. It, I don't know if you've seen it yet. Somebody emailed it to me. Have, There's no, an article that says you guys have already said no to that deal. Oh, no, there was there, it, a letter yeah, by some guy. Names, right. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a, uh, I'll take a look at the, the letter. I, yeah. There's a, the names are similar. A guy's uh, name is Holman that. Jenkins, who wrote this. And he says, yeah. let me find it. I actually have a copy yeah. of it here. It was America's Kansas City Southern. Yeah, let me explain. I can explain quickly okay. what, what I, and he undoubtedly is referring to. Uh, there are two Canadian railroads. One's called Canadian Pacific. Yep. It's the smaller of the two. The other one is Canadian National. Yes. In March, Canadian Pacific came forward and offered to buy Kansas City Southern for about $29 billion. Uh, a few weeks later, Canadian National jumped in and said, we'll offer $33.5 billion. I see. And the, uh, at that time, the Kansas City uh, directors decided to try to make a deal with Canadian National. Both of those railroads asked us to approve a voting trust, and it would take the whole program for me to explain it all, but it is a way for the Kansas City uh, Railroad's shareholders to get paid out and then to have the stock held in trust while we're deciding whether we're actually going to approve this merger. Right. If you approve the trust and that happened, and then a year from now we disapprove the merger, and these merger cases take at least a year, uh, then whoever bought it in trust would have to be forced to divest it and sell it off. Right, right, right. So what, what we did two weeks ago is disapprove the Canadian Nationals voting trust. Canadian National decided to drop out of the picture, and Canadian Pacific got back into a deal with Canada. I see, and that's so, what you're considering now. So that's what we're considering yes. now, and I'm sure that the writer to the Wall Street Journal was referring to the disapproval of the Canadian National Voting Trust. He, he, he's so, actually disapproving of the I, board entirely. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, but that's what he's commenting about. Let me say this, you know, I... Uh, if the people who know something about my political background, everyone would not be surprised that I am not necessarily a favorite of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> no, I can imagine. I, I, I can imagine. And and uh, but this guy was, you know, entire thesis was everything should be completely deregulated, and there should be no regulation about anything, and yeah. uh, right, um, including uh, yeah. emissions and the like. Yeah. yeah. Well, we could go back to the uh, glory days of the. Uh, Robber barons of the 1880s uh, yep. and 90s, and that would be great. Uh, and we and no uh, regulation of playing stockyards and drugs yep. and everything else, yep. and that's what he wants. All right, so, so Marty, you're sitting in a position where your job is to make sure that the markets work efficiently and fairly um, in this enormously important uh, part of our economy. And that's really what this board does. It has unique... <laughs> Um, uh, interest to Chicagoans, right? And, and can you take a minute yeah. and just talk? Because people think, oh, Chicago was once important in rail. <laughs> Chicago, yeah, Chicago <laughs> is, the is the is the rail center, still is of yep. the north Amer of the entire North American continent. Let me just give you a couple of numbers which I had to learn when I was chairman of Metro. Yep. So 
Railroad centers are called terminals. Yep. Not terminals like Union Station, the building, but terminals meaning the entire Chicago metropolitan area where six of those seven major railroads, and it's the only place in the country where this happens, all come together like spokes to a, to a wheel uh, in Chicago. There are 40-some rail yards scattered throughout the city of Chicago. People don't know it because they're you drive down Western Avenue and they're surrounded by trees, but you'll pass five, six, seven railroads just driving down Western Avenue south of the Loop. Yep. As an example, um, and there are railroads in Englewood, uh, rail yards in Englewood. They're all all over. Uh, but this is the astounding number to me. In Chicago, every day, fifteen hundred trains, some of them two or three miles long, come through this metropolitan area. About 750 of them are metro trains. Those are the most frequent. And, of course, they've cut back a little bit during the pandemic, but they're still a high level of trains. And about 700 are freight trains, most of them very long, and about 100 are Amtrak trains. And they're all using the same tracks and rail yards. So it is phenomenal that the system works, and it works extraordinarily well. And here's the other thing that, I found fascinating about how the railroad industry works in a place like Chicago. One would think if you knew nothing as I did, that there's a tower someplace like at O'Hare, right? Mm -hmm. it's because all these trains are crisscrossing and uh, joining each other and so forth. That is not the case. There are about five or six towers. So actually all the Burlington Northern trains are controlled by a person sitting in Fort Worth, Texas in front of a computer screen. The Union Pacific trains are controlled by a person sitting in Omaha. Uh, Canadian Pacific folks are in, Ma in um, Minneapolis and so forth. And the Metro trains are controlled by somebody sitting in, in our in the Metro's offices, rather, downtown. And they all work together. And it is phenomenal, but it is essential to our economy. I mean, the railroads are still a mainstay of Chicago's economy, that's it, crucial. Right, they move tons of freight, and don't don't trains from all over the country come here and then get switched here? Yes, so if you're shipping, so the, the way the system is now set up, you have two large railroads that cover the western half of the United States, the Union Pacific and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. They generally do not go east of the Mississippi River. There are two large railroads in the west, the CSX and the Norfolk Southern, who don't go west of the Mississippi River. So there are several places where those railroads connect in uh, New Orleans, in Memphis, in Chicago, and a few other smaller places. Uh, so, yes, so a, a, a freight shipment going from the west coast to the east coast is brought here by the Union Pacific or BN and switched to the CSX or NS and taken on its way. Um, and that's why you have all these rail yards, and I'm greatly oversimplifying. Thousands yeah. of these switches happen every day. And so, so that, and that's a lot of work for Chicagoans. And yeah. and um, yeah. then there's all these intermodal facilities here, where you know, for 40 years, what looks like a truck has, you know, it can just sort of the top of the truck can end up on a train, right? And exactly. <laughs> that's just the easiest way to understand it. And uh, there are gigantic intermodal yards all over Chicago. The two biggest are down near Joliet. Uh, the um, UP has a very large one, and BN has one equally large near Joliet. But there are intermodal yards. Two of the Norfolk Southern has a gigantic intermodal yard on Western Avenue in the 70s. I was just there yep. a, a week ago. They have another one down near Calumet. Uh, they have uh, one over near Englewood. I mean, they're, they're all over the place, and these uh, thousands, tens of thousands of these containers, and you're absolutely right, they're the size of a semi-truck, are brought in on trains, lifted off by gigantic cranes and onto a chassis connected to a, you know, a semi-tractor yep. and taken someplace. Yep. Uh, it's, it's amazing to behold, um, and that's, you know, so if you're waiting for your lamp from China or a piece of clothing or a golf club, it's in one of those containers someplace. Yep. So it's an amazingly complicated logistical puzzle. Um, the, it's been solved best by efficient markets, and you and I both are left of center, but we can easily say that. But those efficient markets need clear 
regulatory oversight to make them to, to keep them efficient because uh, the incentives to to gain extra control have always been there. Well, the real challenge, you're absolutely right, Edwin, the real challenge for the, those of us charged with regulating the railroad industry is that there, by, by the sheer physical nature of railroads, there are many, many parts of the country where there's no actual competition between railroads. I mean, just think of it. Um, uh, their, their cost, uh, nobody's building new, rail, new railroads from here to California. Right. The two that are there are going to be there. And so unlike many other businesses, uh, you know, if somebody has a great idea for a new restaurant or a bakery, you can open one up down the street. You can't do that with a railroad. So uh, trucks provide some competition to railroads. Um, and the railroads don't like when they resist regulation, say, well, we are in a competitive field because we have to compete with trucks. But one of the problems with that is there's a lot of traffic, and this is something I have been talking a lot about publicly since I've been on the board and more intensely since I've been chairman. There's a lot of freight traffic which could be on the rails, which the rails, for one reason or another, are not really competing for. And so the, it's forced onto trucks. And it is amazing the amount of, um, of pollution that could be taken out of the air if you just took a ton of freight off of a truck and put it on a railroad. Yeah, could, the railroads could... are fond of, uh, of saying you can move one ton of freight 500 miles with one gallon of diesel fuel. You can't move that on a truck anywhere. You can't move that any other so, way. Yep. Yeah, and uh, so, so I have been frustrated because while trucks do provide competition in the purely economic sense, they don't provide competition, in my view, in the public, you know, health sense. Yep. Um, and we, so one of the struggles is to incentivize more competition with railroads in an, in an industry which is basically monopolistic or duopolistic because there are so few big railroads mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. But it would be better, and I have constantly said to the railroads who resist government regulation, do it yourselves. Don't, don't make us regulate. You figure out how to operate more competitively and with better service. And that's a constant tension that I'm engaged yeah. in as we speak. All right. So, Marty, I want to just open up one more uh, conversation, and it may be short about this, yeah. but there is new technology, things like Hyperloop. Does, does new rail technology and, and those kinds of of proposals for you know hyper fast rail transit does that come through you guys too uh well it's interesting it depends on the technology so if it's if it's steel wheels on steel rails absolutely uh the way the statutes are written they're written as though that's the only kind of rail that exists because most of the statutes were written 150 years ago that's so interesting yeah. So, so nobody knows if you really had uh, hyperloop or maglev yep. or those yep. things. Yep. If it's if it's rail, it hasn't been litigated yet, um, and I probably shouldn't uh, comment Don't on apply. it. Right. I really, yeah. <laughs> haven't studied it. Yep. In such a case, could come in front of us. But yep. you can imagine the arguments that these things are effectively rail. Yeah. Um, so so interesting. That hasn't happened. But what but what does come before us? Edwin, and we have cases pending right now, uh, there are several places in the United States where efforts are being made to build the kind of 150, 200 mile high speed rail that's in Japan and yes. China and Europe. Yes. A big project in, in um, Texas and California and a couple of other places. And we, we have jurisdiction over the construction of any new railroad of any kind. Uh -huh. So the request to approve uh, California, um, well, they're all at one state or another pending in front of us. Yep. But we do have something to say about whether these get approved. We don't hand out the money to build them. Um, and they are being built mostly by private funds. Yep. California, a lot of state funds are involved. Yep. Uh, but it's complicated. And um, I will say, and I don't, I will, I'm willing to appropriately say that as a general proposition, philosophically, I favor high-speed rail. I think it's good for the country where it can be done effectively. Yeah, 
Yep. Uh, it makes sense. All right. Well, Marty, uh, thank you for giving me some of your Saturday. I really appreciate it. It's good to catch yeah. up. And, oh, no. and we didn't even talk about the city's budget fights. So. No. You know something? <laughs> yeah. There's one great advantage of being a federal official. Yeah. Not only should I, should I not talk about those, but I don't have time to to be knowledgeable about them anymore because my brain is filled with railroads. Yep, and one thing that is important for everyone in the city council to know is there's life after being an alderman. There is. I got a, uh, so people probably are listening probably don't know this. I ceased being an alderman in 1987, and uh, I got a letter from a mutual friend of ours, so I won't name Edward, about a w- two weeks ago saying, I have disproven F. Scott Fitzgerald's adage, and there, there is room for second acts. So, oh, my I gosh. Yep. And, you're, and you're not doing so badly yourself. Yeah, no, all is so good. <laughs> all right, Marty, enjoy. Yeah. We'll catch up soon. Thank you. We're going to take right, a brief. Well, yep. We're going to take a break, and I will be back and taking your calls in just a bit. I'm David Hochberg. It's Saturday, and you're constantly complaining about paying PMI on your FHA loan, but you've done nothing about it. If you took out a 30-year fixed loan after June of 2013, and your loan to value was greater than 90%, you will have PMI for the entire length of your loan. Team Hochberg has helped thousands of radio listeners refinance out of their FHA loan to eliminate their PMI, but we can't help if you don't call 855-563-2843 or visit 56david.com. Also, have financially closing lender, LMLS 112-4061. Hi everyone, Tooth19 here. Did you ever wonder why in a world as advanced as ours, where common man can travel to space and back, why we can't provide an easier way to do dentistry? I wonder all the time. I would love to have a dental appointment that's fast, no noise, no anxiety, no gagging, and no bad tasting stuff. Well, the staff at Total Dentistry told me that's possible with sedation dentistry. It's a calm, relaxed way to get treatment. So those worries like gagging or anxiety become minimized by the sedation. And for those with busy lifestyles where four to five appointments isn't practical, one day dentistry with sedation is the perfect solution. Hmm, I wonder if Dr. Pellick and Total Dentistry will be our first floating dental office in space. Total Dentistry, a general dental practice like no other. Call 847-358-2477 for your free sedation consultation today. 847-358-2477. Of all the things you do to protect your health, none is more important than staying on your medication. And here's a little encouragement. At CVS, you can earn up to 50 extra bucks rewards each year just for filling your prescriptions. That's healthier made easier. Visit your local CVS to sign up and start earning now. Terms and conditions apply. Not available in all states. See cvs.com slash rxrewards or the pharmacy for details. This is John Daniel, President and Business Manager of the Sheet Metal Workers of Smart Local 265. The principles that guide me are rooted in the simple belief that united we stand and divided we fall. We the people must recognize that a diverse environment with unique points of view is the foundation for success. A culture where labor and management work together inspires innovation, promotes inclusion, creates a sustainable growth for business, the workforce, and our communities. When the entrepreneur's vision is developed and improved with the voice of a unionized workforce, you build more than just a product, you build a stronger future. I want to personally thank everyone who voted for President Biden. He believes in unions. Blue Collar Biden signed the American Rescue Act of 2021, which secures vested pension benefits. It funds improvements of indoor air quality in K-12 schools and provides additional paycheck protection program loans to support small businesses. This is John Daniel from Smart Local 265. Join me in celebrating a return to sanity and a sustainable middle class. Stay union strong. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. 
wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code TIME for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code TIME for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code TIME. This is WCPT 820, where facts matter. You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisendraft on WCPT 820. Okay, we're back at 773-763-9278, and I want to hear from you. Uh, I left some time so that we could talk, and I just want to say about the people that we've talked to so far today, I I thought Saru was fabulous. I mean, I know a lot of good restaurant owners. I'm not saying owners of good restaurants, although they're that too. I'm talking about decent people who wouldn't countenance the kind of harassment or mistreatment that Saru has found all over the industry. But facts are here. And we have to consider that people can be blinded by the commonplace around them and bad behavior is commonplace in that industry. So when people say, oh, well, you can't pay the minimum wage to restaurant workers, but California does. There are plenty of restaurants in California. My brother lives there. I, I, I go see them. There's, and they're all kinds and at all price points. It just doesn't make any sense. And, um, you know, I, as I said at the beginning of this show about the kind of show I want to have, we spend a lot of time talking about politics. But politics isn't an end. It's a means. What kind of society do we want to have? How do we want to be treated? How do we want to treat each other? I mean, I love going out to eat. I'm going to go out to eat the restaurants that Alderman Viegas named a little while ago. But I can't be complacent about the conditions where Americans work all day and still require food stamps to feed their families. That doesn't make any sense to me. We can't be comfortable. I can't be comfortable when people are forced to strip away their dignity and their masks in order to get paid. Uh, Talking to Saru raised another question for me, and that's um, what role workers in an industry have when it comes to their condition of employment, you know, and uh, thanks to the 14th Amendment, uh, people have the right to walk away when they don't like a job, and today they're doing it by the thousands. Their absence, uh, I think, and all the help wanted signs um, are raising some really important questions that we should pay attention to. So a shout out to everyone who works in the restaurant industry. Stand in their shoes, not just for a moment, but all for a long and busy shift or for a long and slow shift might even be worse. Try to make your rent payment during a slow month like January when there aren't any tips or stand in the shoes of the woman who's asked to take off her mask notwithstanding the pandemic so somebody can decide whether she's cute enough to tip. It's repulsive. I'd rather live in a place where people get paid fairly by their employers. I think you guys would too. And a shout out to all of those folks who are working in the rail industry that Marty just talked about. The really thousands of good jobs in and around Chicago, uh, n- not just working on trains, but working in all those switching stations. Really important work, not only uh, uh, for our local economy, but keeps the whole thing humming. All right, I'm taking your calls, and uh, Michael, you're on. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Michael O'Connor. Um, I have been listening to WCPT for quite some time. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Michael. Yes, thank you. I've been listening to WCPT for quite some time. Um, actually, I'm a friend of your former um, first assistant, Zenobia Black, when you work at CHS. I love Zenobia and Tim. Yeah, exactly. They're my mentors, actually. Well, you pick good um, ones. I'm calling. Yeah, thank you. I'm calling because I'm dealing with, um, I thought it was interesting that Alderman Villegas did not talk a little bit more thoroughly about the uh, possibility, especially with Lincoln Yard, because Lincoln Yard uh, got a $2.4 billion TIF. Uh, that they ran through before Lori Lightfoot became mayor. And with that $2.4 billion tip, you asked a question concerning minority count that may be coming up this month 
and he said he has absolutely said nothing about the waiver issues that larger companies use when they make the excuse for not hiring black uh, uh, folks by basically saying we couldn't find any, and they get a waiver. And um, the abuse is almost legendary, especially by the bigger firms, because I remember um, the Mac Hughes Construction Company, and their 12, they paid $12 million as a settlement in a minority contract probe because uh, they were one of the people was one of the executives was using his wife as a shell company, and they were getting contracts. So I know I hope that you have him back on to answer a few more questions as a legislator specifically about what his committee is going to do. Um, the his committee, the the Economic Capital and Technology Development Committee which is co-chaired, I was actually vice chair, Greg Mitchell, who, I, quite frankly, uh, I've never heard do any visibility, period. Uh, and he's an alderman. This is the guy of the Seventh Ward. Now, I, I live in Pat Dow's ward. I used to live in the Second Ward with Brian Hopkins, so I know the tricks of the game. And I've been around for a little while, so I hope you have him on. But um, secondly... I thought your conversation with the organizer for the Fair Wage was a great conversation. I'd like to, uh, hopefully you'll have someone on uh, that will deal with wage theft and how wage theft is only the tip of the iceberg, according to um, uh, uh, Helen uh, LeVan. Uh, she's uh, a management and entrepreneurship. She teaches mm-hmm. that at DePaul. And clearly, a lot of big companies are doing it, but a lot of restaurants are doing it. And I believe, well, hospitality, I won't just say restaurants. Yep. But that's why a lot of low-paid low, 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 low paid workers aren't going back. Now, I hear very little for people who are seniors, like myself, who would like to go back to work, but don't want to be bothered with the shenanigans. Yeah, I would hope that there would be a conversation concerning that. Uh, well, Michael, I'm going to take your I'm going to take your uh, suggestion seriously. I do think we will get data from Lincoln Yards and other big projects as they start to uh, as they start to wind up, and we'll look carefully at that data. Now um, we know more about ourselves than we did. We have more data about ourselves. Well, one, one of the great things about the Saru's work in the restaurant industry is she has she has done the studies and laid bare the data so that we can see um, what the facts are, and now we can act on them. And we're going to have data on these big projects, and not just Lincoln Yards, but their projects on the uh, old Michael Reese site, and their projects on those rail yards that run south. Uh, of Taylor Street. So we're going to have a lot of information that we can look through, and then we can hold people to account for hiring Chicagoans and people who've been left out. Look, it benefits everybody if we can lift people up in Chicago. Everybody. And, you know, the taxpayers in Lincoln Park who aren't going to be hired for that work but are paying high property taxes, they benefit when property values and and uh, uh, family incomes go up in every neighborhood in the city. It's important that everyone knows that, and I really appreciate your bringing it up. We will keep talking about these topics and dig deeper. Th- I appreciate your call, Michael. And if you see Zenobia and Tim, send them my best. I will, and thank you. You bet. Ken, you're on. Hey, Edwin, you were my alderman once upon a time. I hope I didn't drive you away. No, you know it was okay. I, I, I actually, got to, you weren't you weren't an alderman for very long, were you? Eight years. In Park. Eight years oh. felt like a long time. Yeah, I think I was. Well, yeah. Anyway, I think I moved <laughs> away. Um, but um, I just guess I just found uh, two of the conversations this afternoon a little, hmm, I guess, concerning from a political reality standpoint, and maybe from a what we're about as a country standpoint. Talk to me about that. I'm interested in your well, thoughts. You know, when the right wing says people are socialists, 
What they mean is, well, gee, we want to somehow regulate the restaurant industry to pay them more and treat people better. I mean, it's a free market economy. People know what they're getting paid, how they're going to be treated. If they don't like it, they can get another job. That's how America works. Right, and and f- thanks to the 14th Amendment, you're absolutely right. People can leave and get another job. Um, and it turns out that's what they're doing in droves yeah. right uh, now. So if, people, so if restaurant owners don't want to pay people right, if they don't have a situation, my uh, two of my kids, when they were in high school and then in college, uh, worked in uh, a couple of different kinds of restaurants, and they both, and they were like 18, 19, 20 years old, they both discovered how to find a restaurant that paid better, a restaurant, well, not paid better, but that had um, better, you know, a better clientele, that where they would get tipped more, where the food was better, where there was more alcohol served, and so they, were, they made really good money. I mean, if people want to work at some, not, if people either want to or need to work at some not-so-great place, well, I don't know what to say. There's plenty of jobs out there. I don't feel like the government in any way, shape, or form should be regulating any industry to that extent. Well, wait, hang on. So you, uh, let this be clear. The ask here is that the minimum wage be the minimum wage across every industry and, and that the restaurant industry isn't singled out and said, you know, you don't have to pay a minimum wage. So are you saying, do, do, you, do you object to minimum wages in other industries too? Yeah, pr- pr- I mean, I, I just don't, I mean, who's working for the minimum wage, really? A lot My of kids people. didn't work for the minimum wage in high school. Well, well, I don't know why they're working for the minimum wage, honestly, Edwin. I, I don't know. Do they not have skills? My kids were making more than the minimum at high school. Yeah, well, you it, it doesn't... the minimum today at Target. I mean, you know, l- 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 let's be real. There isn't this cadre of people who are really together that makes a minimum wage year on and year on. Oh, really. I think... I think that's not right. I think the statistics are that a lot of Americans, a lot of Americans make the minimum wage. And it's, you know, the job market is interesting, um, uh, but depends on how much education you have. It depends on where you live. Sometimes it depends on what you look like. Um, People made bad choices. I, I don't know what you do about that. All I know is the restaurants, my kids made so much more than the minimum wage off of tips. You know, if, if you start saying we're going to raise their wages, then do I not have to tip? Is nobody going to tip? Well, California is a good work. example, and I and and they pay the minimum. The minimum wage is the law in California for restaurant workers, and people tip, and so, so people guess, restaurant workers eat even more. And and but all, there's no all shortage really, of restaurants. <laughs> it's you know the Democrats have a veto-proof majority here in Illinois. If you guys want to do it, do it. I don't, you know, well, I, 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 there are a lot of issues that come up, and. Um, uh, you know, the, the legislating is hard work, and, it, you know, in Illinois, the thing that took them most of the last session and then some was getting a, a clean energy bill passed, um, and I'm, I'm proud of that work. It's going to make a difference for all of us. And the other one I'm just really kind of, I'm sorry, I had to roll my eyes at. If, if the railroad industry, had, if there's certain freight they don't want to haul for whatever reason, I mean, come on, you're going to make them haul freight because you think it's better for the environment? No, I, I, I uh, you know, I, in fairness to Marty, I, that was just a time, he, he mentioned it, I didn't have a chance to dive into it, I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but I think he wants, you know, I mean, all of us will benefit from a more competitive transit market. I think that's well, I mean, the main point. I mean, I mean, the truth about the railroads is, if you go back 50 years, they were all chronically bankrupt. Because there were too many of them, they could. None of them ever made any money. No, that's People that's exactly about, right. In their they, early years, they in their early years they made a fortune for people. Then they went through a period where there was too many of them, and they didn't. Um, then they deregulated, and uh, the number of things happened. And then they started to monopolize. It's a pattern. Finding the right regulation that makes them efficient um, is going to be good for all of us. Hey, I, I, Ken, I'm glad you're a listener. I love having opinions that aren't mine on the air. I hope you will continue to call in and sure. we can continue to have these discussions. Thanks, Ed. Take care, man. You bet. Uh, uh, Jossie, you're on the air. Hello? Hello there. Hi. Hi. You're on WCPT. Well, thank you so much for um, letting me phone in. Um, 
I am actually uh, a little saddened by the last caller. Um, he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about when it comes to people um, trying to find a better job in, you know, the service industry. And I hope he's still listening. So, t- so, so, t- if he, he may be or he may not be, but the audience is. So, why don't you share your sure. experience? So, you know, this show today, your show is fantastic. It's um, broached a lot of different subjects, um, but just to um, maybe make him a little more aware of what the reality is. I am um, sadly a, a single mom uh, in my. 50s now, um, worked in the service industry for over 25 years. Um, my husband passed away three years ago. And, um, you know, we always worked. Um, he uh, was um, taken from us, and l- luckily I, I was able to get survivor's benefits. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because as a server and bartender in the city, I had an accident at a restaurant, and um, it was life changing, devastating. I mean, it's changed everything in, in my life and in my son's life. Um, now disabled, and uh, I'm not able to get uh, disability because of a lot of reasons, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what I want to say is that there is absolutely no way for a person to tell, you know, if this is a fantastic job when they take a serving job. Um, and not every um, person is lucky to have parents, you know, that help them out, that allow them to get a serving job or a restaurant job later on in life and where they can find or they have the time, rather, to pick and choose, you know, what kind of uh, uh, joint or bar they want to work at, you know. A lot of moms, yep, a lot of yep, uh, yep. students, you know, are, are you know, doing the jobs and um in the city of chicago i mean yes we have a ton of great restaurants but it doesn't doesn't even um i'm running on a tangent here because i'm a little emotional um well let me help you out a bit here what 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 i've heard and what your story it's it's actually part of two stories we've talking about the survivor benefits you got are related to the guaranteed wage experiment that we're running in Chicago that will be very important for the whole country and they were very important for you Um, and your point that people work hard they end up in uh, finding jobs wherever they can and sometimes those jobs are not what you know are very tough and they don't pay what you thought and the conditions are hard and sometimes uh, uh, they're demeaning, but you work hard, you get up, you go to work and you don't complain about it. And that's just who Americans are, but we ought to make the playing field fairer. Thank you for your, thank you for calling in. I, I please keep listening and I hope that things work out for you. I'm grateful for all the resources. You bet. All right. Uh, Roosevelt, I think you're next. Hello. Thank you for taking my call, sir. You bet. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to start, but I will start here. Uh, the lady is right on point, and the last gentleman before her is totally, totally wrong. And here's the thing. If you leave it up to a company to raise the wages, it's not going to happen. And and one thing, there's a couple of things. Edwin, Edwin is your name, sir, and uh, my name is Roosevelt, by the way. I know I said that before, but... Uh, you have to bring race into it. You have to bring the fact of what nationalities and what race of people work in the restaurant business and why. Why is it that most of the... I used to work at, at restaurants. Why is it that most of the people who work at restaurants are predominantly Latino or minority? Because they don't pay enough. Because there's no union. And that's it, Edwin. You have to bring up the fact of union. And let's examine what has happened in the past, let's say, four or six years. The state of Florida voted for a minimum wage of $15 an hour, and that's a Republican state, a red state. What does that tell you? That they're not getting paid the right amount that it, that to live on one paycheck. That they're not getting benefits, especially in the restaurant business, especially in the uh, hotel industry. 
So, all right, so, all these so Roosevelt, let me respond a little bit. Um, I I agree with you. And when Saru was here, she talked about the um, the disparate impact that that uh, and the people who are most impacted by poorer wages and poorer conditions and uh, and uh, uh, get fewer tips are uh, uh, women and people of color so that uh, and they get harassed more so that so that the issue was um, was pay and conditions um, uh, and uh, demeaning attitude um, all of that um, now you asked about unions um, I, I don't think anybody would say you, you can't unionize and and I uh, am a big uh, union supporter, but I don't think we're going to wait on uh, the unionization of every restaurant before no. trying to pass a minimum wage law. Let's get the minimum wage law done. Yeah, and, and one more thing I wanted to say, well, a couple of things I wanted to say also. Yep. Is, has, are you aware of what's going on in the um, tortilla industry here in Chicago? There's a tortilla called El Milagro, which means the miracle. Yeah, they had a lockout, which just ended this morning. Yeah, yeah. and you know why? Because the conditions are the same that they were back in the 50s. The people are complaining of horrible heat. They don't have uh, the right amount of ventilation in there. Their quarters are cramped up in there, and they're getting paid peanuts. Also, maybe I'll get a chance to investigate that. Uh, Yeah, you can do that. It would, be, it would be interesting to hear from people who are there. That's a good thought. I might take you up on that. Thank you for your call. Keep listening. Thank really appreciate much. it. Thank you. Steve, you're on, and I'm going to let you have the last, uh, this would be the last caller before we take the break at the top of the hour and move to talk to Alderman Scott Wagsback about the city budget and other things. Steve? Yes, uh, well, I want to make a few points. Uh, one, I, I do think that we need a national push, not just for uh, a, an increase in the minimum wage, but uh, an a evolutionary rise in that wage uh, in terms of cost of living. As, because as it stands now, it's, it's strictly arbitrary. It's, you know, cost of living goes up virtually every year, but it's only when you know, we decide to take it up uh, in terms of legislation that we raise minimum wage. Okay, well, so you, you're advocating for a, minimum, a national minimum wage, no uh, sub-minimum wage categories like restaurant workers, and you want it to be indexed to inflation. Right, exactly. Yes. Okay. Because as of right now, you could go seven, eight, ten years, no increase, and yet your your uh, costs are continuing to go up as a consumer, but your wages don't. So yes, we need that, and I, and I recognize fully that different states and different cities have a different cost of living. So yes, that is a little bit problematic, but I'm sure we can work through that. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, observation, and we're going to take a quick break, and then I'm coming back with my alderman, Alderman Scott Wags, back in just a minute. Windows down, crisp air, and a pleasant breeze. It's time to get into the driver's seat of the new 2021 Porsche Macan from the Porsche Exchange and fly. Featuring a powerful 2.0-liter four-cylinder turbo engine and all the comfort, technology, and performance you've come to expect from Porsche. Lease your new Macan for just $739 a month for 36 months. Only at the Porsche Exchange in Highland Park. Expect the exceptional. Visit us at 4Porsche.com. The number 4, Porsche.com. 4079 to at this inception. Plus tax title license and doc fit. No security deposit required. See delivery details. NBC News Radio. I'm Michael Kastner. President Biden is spending the weekend at Camp David ahead of next week's crucial votes on Capitol Hill. The President First Lady left the White House Friday afternoon following a meeting with the Prime Ministers of India, Australia, and Japan. Before he left, the President told reporters he isn't worried that his agenda is in trouble. I believe we're going to end up getting both the pieces of my economic legislation. Biden told reporters he would talk more about his infrastructure plan after it passes. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is promising the bipartisan infrastructure bill will come up for a vote next week. Lisa Taylor with more. She told reporters her chamber will vote on it Monday. Progressives and moderates in the Democratic Party have been in a battle over the timeline when it comes to that measure and a separate bill. Democrats are aiming to pass the second measure, known as a reconciliation bill, without Republican support. 
Executive privilege won't be invoked to shield former President Trump's White House records from the House committee investigating the Capitol attack. That's according to White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, who said Trump hasn't asked President Biden to invoke it. We have been working closely with uh, with congressional committees and others as they work to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th, an incredibly dark day in our democracy. She said Biden doesn't think it's appropriate to assert executive privilege in this case. The manhunt for Brian Laundry is resuming this weekend in the Florida wetlands. Jim Forbes with the latest. The FBI issued an arrest warrant for Laundry this week in connection with the death and disappearance of his fiance, Gabby Petito. Petito was last seen in late August and her remains were found in Wyoming last Sunday. Laundry is a person of interest in the case and has been missing for over a week. Authorities believe he's hiding out in a South Florida nature reserve. The FBI posted Friday that they'll be searching the reserve throughout the weekend. Michael Kastner, NBC News Radio. Joan Esposito Live Local and Progressive on WCPT Willow Springs is powered by ComEd. Lower your energy bills and reduce your carbon footprint with the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program. That's the sound of the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program saving you money and energy with rebates on energy star appliances so you can come back to a home full of savings <laughs> discover more ways to save at comed.com slash home savings comed powering lives hi jason here from chicago community acupuncture at milwaukee devon and nagel in chicago you know why we advertise in WCPT? Well, for one thing, we believe in the progressive agenda and want to keep these voices on the air. But secondly, it's a good fit for us. Progressives tend to be proactive about their health. They're wary of big pharma and a medical system that's designed to keep them dependent on dangerous drugs, and they're smart enough to know if someone's just pandering to them. You beautiful, beautiful people. But seriously, acupuncture is the longest studied, least invasive, and safest healing system out there. It should be our first line of defense. And at Chicago Community Acupuncture, we offer top quality treatment at about half the price of other places. You don't have to live with pain, discomfort, or dysfunction. Acupuncture has helped billions of people. It can help you too. Call us at 773-853-0920. 773-853-0920. Or go to shycomacu.com. C-H-I-C-O-M-A-C-U.com. And start feeling better today. This is WCPT 820, where facts matter. You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisendraft on WCPT 820. And we're back, and I'm joined by Alderman Scott Wegspeck, who is my alderman and chairs the City Finance Committee. Hello there, Scott. Hey, Edwin. How you doing today? Good. Thank you for, uh, for doing this. You know, I asked... Uh, somebody was working with uh, the administration if they had someone who could help me understand the budget. And they said, sure, and they volunteered you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so I know you're not speaking for the administration. I don't want to put you in that, in that, um, in, in that box, but you, you, you're close enough to know what the thinking was behind some of the things in the budget, right? Yeah, I, I would say so. And I think um, a lot of people in the council would be because they've been listening very closely and have been really trying to do a lot of the things that the aldermen and I think communities want to see uh, across the board with the with the budget this year and with uh, ARP funding. Well, I would. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to just for the sake of this conversation, um, be on the side of yeah the, no question i think they did everything for everybody in this budget so let, let me understand let me understand this this christmas time um the document begins can we start where where the mayor began in her conversation because i i want to understand this and it's not really in the budget docs so i want to understand where it comes from she talked about almost 300 million in savings from efficiencies and that broke down to 46 million in personnel savings, 21 million in healthcare savings, and 131 million in improved fiscal management. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, so I, you know, starting out with fiscal management, um, you know, we're we're seeing, I think, around the edges of programs like workers' comp, 
uh, which we moved from the finance committee yeah, you over did that. to the yep. government. Yeah. Yep. And I think um, what we're seeing there is just uh, a lot of effort by the comptroller. And, you know, we'll have an audit come out on that pretty soon, um, I think in the next two weeks. But we're supposed to see a lot of reduction in savings there, which are built into a little bit of this a budget. Um, when you're talking about savings across these different departments, you know, sometimes we think of, well, they, they took vacancies out and those are, you know, efficiencies or savings. Yep. That's not necessarily so in this budget. It really is looking at the programs that have been in place for many years, um, going through contracts that um, we hadn't gone through for 10 years or more and saying, we'd like to rework this contract and save $5 million here, a million there, $10 million here. Yeah, that would be and like in the cost right. recovery side, right? And maybe an improved fiscal yeah. management. But the the personnel savings are probably vacancies, I guess. It's hard to tell. That's, yeah, some of that is definitely vacancies. Mm-hmm. The, the health care savings, uh, that's not that, you know, what they used to do, which was say, we're going to cut the benefits that we're giving to you. Right. Uh, this is really around going back to Blue Cross, Blue Shield, companies like that, and saying we want to renegotiate um, based on some maybe some of the new federal laws. We want to renegotiate our contracts with you and see if we can get better pricing on some things. So that's ah, uh, and that happened. That. Yeah, and I think what um, you know what we're. Well, one part that we were having a little trouble with, we did have a chief risk officer for a while who was trying to help us out with, uh, with, um, sorry, I'm actually in a tunnel here, but, uh, we actually had some savings, uh, through the chief risk officer and the work that they were doing to try to reduce costs as well and look at all these healthcare contracts. So that's really where the bulk of the three things that you were talking about are. Okay. I mean, it's, so it, I wanted to start with the savings side because, um, you know, A, that's where Lori started when she talked about uh, 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 the budget, but um, really the budget's about spending. Um, and there's t- there's tons. Of, I don't even know where to start. There's so many new programs and so much money. Um, uh, just I'm going to run through some of them. Uh, 86 million for mental health. That goes, that, where does that money go? Well, that is going to a lot more new programming that Alderman and the community groups were looking for. They wanted to have wraparound services. They wanted to make sure that the funds, you know, a lot of people have said reopen the mental health clinics and as we know, a lot of that funding over the last several years went to the FQHCs, so uh, trying to bolster the support that they were giving to them. But this this mental health effort is really looking at the wraparound work and trying to make sure that we're getting money directly into the hands of the the communities that have uh, the most high-risk needs for mental health issues. you know, there, I don't, there's another portion of it that is going to be addressing mental health issues with police officers. Yes, I saw that. Creating um, yep. ombudsman there. Yep. And I think most aldermen agreed that that was an area that we really need to see an investment to. And that, that is part of the police contract. So that came about in negotiations with them, which is probably an issue you want to talk about later. But it, I think it was important because what we see with officers is that they go through a ton of stress, too. And in some cases, the situations um, lead us to even worse situations. And um, having officers who are de-stressed and, and ready to address issues uh, is more important. So Okay, so let's it, take those two together, Scott, because policing is a terrifying job, an enormously stressful job. Um, one that even people who are the biggest advocates for police reform still believe that police police officers should be out there and it's a frightening job. They also think maybe they shouldn't be the first one knocking on your door. Maybe some of this mental health money will allow um, uh, someone with mental health training to come if it's that kind of problem and not really a police problem. Yeah, and that's... I think the the big key there was seeing um, 
you know, the mayor wanted a co-responder model. Some aldermen wanted direct social workers going out for situations. Um, and I think investing in this model overall is a, is a great direction to go in. And I think everybody agrees it's a good start. Um, I, I still think we need to keep looking at ways to in, increase the number of social workers that we're putting out there with police officers starting out that way. But yeah. I think it's a good direction. And, and the goal here is to have, let me say it differently and you can tell me if this is crazy. So people have said defund the police and you're not saying that and the mayor's not saying that. Um, but what we're saying instead is if we do the right kinds of investments in communities, there'll be fewer calls for the police. We'll have, we'll have the equivalent of a peace dividend at some point. You know, because you, the current strategy is put more money into traditional policing. We see more crime. Criminals get more guns. We put more money into traditional policing. And there's an arms race on both sides. And it's, it's the, you're spending money here to try and de-escalate that in a number of ways. Does that sound right? Yeah, and I... Yeah, and I think even the police officers that I've talked to have said this is a this is a great idea. It's a great start and approach to the tackling this issue. I think they would like to see certain uh, professionals, like a we'll just say a social worker, tackle a lot of these issues on these calls that they get. Um, now, some of them that might be more uh, you know difficult situations. I still think they want a police officer there, but. Mm -hmm. For the most part, officers say we'd be happy to have somebody else respond to some of these calls. And, you know, you, you, as an alderman, you know what those calls are. You, you hear about hundreds of them every year that don't necessarily require a police officer. Um, they require somebody else that has, you know, uh, different health skill training, set. Different uh, skill set. Right. Yeah. Right. That officers don't have. They're not trained. Um, and they shouldn't be trained. I mean, they should be trained because they're they are going through crisis intervention training more so than in the past, uh, and they should always have that. But they're um, they're trained as police officers, not as you know a, a mental health professional. Right, but they are trained to de-escalate. They are yeah, more recently than mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. So that's that's something we need to continue. Just because we're sending somebody else out there doesn't mean we should, shouldn't uh, continue to train them on de-escalation and crisis intervention right. and, um, right. in case they are alone out there. Yep. And, and as you said, th this budget includes an investment in police mental health um, directly. Yes. And, and I was surprised that the FOP actually agreed to that, but I'm, I'm very happy to see that they did because we all know, you know, the president of the FOP has been pushing back pretty hard on a lot of issues, but, um, you know, we have an interim agreement, we have uh, ways to go on some other issues, but I think this is a really good start by them agreeing to do this. Yep. Um, I, there are the, I think you have, let's explain that to everybody further. The, the police, uh, contract that the was just ratified, um, is, a, is a, an interim agreement. But it's not an agreement that gets abrogated, I think, if you don't get it, does it, if you don't make progress on some of the other issues? No, this, it, we would, uh, it would stay in place. And I think our, our um, other pieces that they're working on, um, you know, are going to be helpful. But I would say this one, the city definitely does not want to open it up to arbitration. Yes. Um, a, a couple of quick pieces in that, uh, you know, they can't destroy disciplinary records anymore. And, you know, that's been a long decades, uh, long standing issue that they've been allowed to do. And the other thing was an anonymous complaints. And that was something that all communities were kind of fighting for. And they agreed to it in this, in this contract. So I don't, I, know, I think some, they, didn't they also Scott agree that are, they can't change testimony? Correct. And that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, we saw that in Laquan McDonald yep. and, I think a lot of our colleagues are like, well, we didn't get enough on this. And um, a lot of my black colleagues said, look, you know, when we, about four years ago, we put together, a, I think it was a 15 point plan of things that we wanted to see in the next contract. And I think there were probably 14 out of the 15 things that came to fruition in this. So um, a lot of our colleagues are saying, hey, this is, this is pretty good progress uh, for a police contract that hadn't really been uh, 
changed in decades. So um, I, yeah, let's put a stake in the ground so everybody understands this. Policing in Chicago um, has some old habits that have survived, uh, you know, uh, Richard M. Daly's uh, uh, sometimes efforts at changing them, Rahm's sometimes efforts at changing them. And they just didn't, they thought it was too hard a fight and let it, let stuff ride for a very long time. Policing has been yeah, that was pretty much it. enormously difficult to change because in some ways, look, everybody knows they need police and police peace is important for the city. So it's made it almost impossible to change. And at the same time, it's meant that whole neighborhoods haven't trusted the police. So what you've done is get some of the change that's been impossible to get, get an agreement to keep talking about some of the other change and at the same time passed a civilian oversight bill that's going to change the relationship between communities and policing yeah and these were these were several changes that took time to get to i mean as long as i've been alderman we've been uh promoting some of these changes and you know to be here for a decade plus and finally see the needle swing very far on this issue has been been pretty gratifying yeah it takes it does take an enormous amount of time oh, okay so but I, I give credit to the mayor for really sticking to the guns that you know of uh change and that we're not going to back off from some of these issues and you know she did go at it with uh, the fop president but i think you know the fact that they came to this agreement is a good sign yeah i, I think everybody's gone at it with the fop president that, I mean, the mayor's done a lot of things that are unique. That doesn't single her out. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, there's money in here for um, violence prevention, but it's not policing money. It doesn't look. It doesn't go to the police budget. It's 135 million. Uh, so, it, in general, I guess there are a lot of places where money is being spent for programs, and I don't see it in the departments where I would expect to see it. It has, have decisions been made yet about how to spend the money that is being asked for in the budget? Or are we going to take time to say, okay, we, look, oh, I mean, pick a, pick a program. Pick the guaranteed minimum income program. Somebody's got to figure out what families are eligible. Somebody's got to figure out what families get it. Because it's a national pilot, somebody's got to figure out how to, how to do the research, right? How to have a control group. I don't know if that expertise exists today in the city administration. So what's the bridge between here are the things we want to do and here's how we're going to get them done? Well, it's going to require, I think, um, you know, we have a lot of experts in the city. We don't always have to go outside to get them. Um, those experts, I think, exist in community organizations. Um, they exist in uh, our local government or um sister agencies maybe. So sitting some of these people down at the table and saying, look, we, we're going to set aside this amount of money, in this case the um, uh, guaranteed income, uh, let's, put some, let's think about the kind of parameters we're going to put around it. And I rem if you recall a few years ago, Ron created something called the Catalyst Fund. And he, he kind of created these funds that were kind of loose end um, type funds and I recall at one point, you know, we were looking at the, the way it was set up and this, go, this goes back to the ROM one yep. and they had about a hundred million dollars in there. Yep. And we said, look, this, these funds should go to the communities that need it most. And the way you have this thing written technically, you know, I could have a business come in there or an organization dependent, you know, it doesn't matter what kind it was. And they could ask for five, 10, $20 million out of this fund. And they could be from, from our neighborhood up here on the north side, that's, you know, Lincoln Park, technically. And, and they were like, yeah, they could do that. And we said, look, having that wide open set of parameters, that, that's just not going to work because you'll have the same people tapping into it that have tapped into these programs for decades and kind of subverted the, the original intention of these um, types of programs. So what we need on this one is really to look at um, good circuit breakers, who can really tap into the funds, what, um, uh, say, track are they from you know the geographic track census track yep make sure that the census track and make sure that the money is going into the communities and to directly to the people that really need it so 
So, but there's, there's people who know how to put those things together. And I think they're in government and they're in the community organizations, um, that do a lot of this good work. Like, you know, say somebody from the community, uh, Chicago community trust or, you know, anything like that. So there's, there's a few of those programs that even with my fellow aldermen, we were sitting there yesterday saying, uh, they just put aside, you know, several hundred thousand dollars for each alderman for, um, my basically micro loans and, or micro fund. And I said, well, even I don't know, what the parameters are around that, but we better put some in really quick before. Yeah, otherwise, the feds will be all over you. Yeah, That's right. It'll be an alder. It'll be an alderman indictment program. Like they are on some aldermen yeah. already. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so that that one can be. Uh, you know, should it be infrastructure? Uh, should it be neighborhood organizations? Should it be the arts, culture? Yep. It, you really need to put parameters around those kind well, of. I things. bet. So, so what you said though. Uh, before we get to that program, it's really interesting because you're, you, you know, tr- traditionally think, okay, here's a budget, here's how the city's going to spend spend the money, and we're going to do these things. But your really expansive view of who's got the expertise for this includes those in government and those out of government, and that a lot of this work will be done either in in, in consultation with external partners or delegated through external partners. Correct. Yeah. Most of the time it's just delegated and the government decides what, what's really happening. But I think the mayor's done a good thing here to, to really reach out to these different community groups and say, what is it that you need? Um, kind of compiled those lists and came back and said, you know, affordable housing, here's how much you need for the guaranteed income. Here's what you need. Um, and you, you've kind of read through a lot of it that that's really money for affordable housing and for homeless prevention. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and and that's got to be worked on. Thing. Out. That, that's got to yeah. be worked on largely, I would think, by community groups. Yeah, because, uh, you know, to be honest, I would not put it to the CHA. I would not just say, hey, you know, we're going to hand over the funds to you or to one particular department. It really needs to be with these organizations out there that um, that are doing that kind of work. Um, so, Scott, this is... Um, you know, I mean, the city got an, a, a lot of federal money this year, um, more than it's ever going to get. And, you know, you think back on when was the last time Chicago got a pile of federal money and turned to community organizations to figure out how to spend a lot of it um, uh, for the benefit of communities. And I have to go back almost to 1970 to to model cities programming life. for this yeah. right but that that had an unhappy history in chicago so i just i i'm hoping that somebody goes back and looks at the lessons i know they're old but they're relevant for how to make this stuff happen because um accountability is very hard you know and people will want to see results for this enormous amount of spending. Well, and there's two things with that. Um, I would say is one, you know, you're getting a one time amount of funds. And so you do want to be careful about creating programs that only have that one infusion of, of funds. So you want to make sure that wherever we put it, it's sustainable funding. So this, this either kicks off um, a, pr- a new program that you you know, you know, in next year's budget or next year's state budget or federal budget that you're going to have a continuation of funds coming in. And I think affordable housing is one of those areas that, you know, you know, this is, this is sort of a uh, trigger fund to keep it going. Um, so you've got to be careful about that, that you just don't start a program and then you're stuck with uh, an unsustainable program. Yep. And the other one, the other program that I look back to was um, the, after the 2008, nine market crash, housing market crash, Chicago did get a huge infusion of funds. And just talking to some of my colleagues over the last, you know, year, as we were going through ARP funding, COVID funding coming from the federal government, one of the things that I kept saying was, you know, when I look back at that, there were, you know, I can look at the list of things that we got money for back then. 
but it was all decided for the most part. I would say like 95% of it was already decided how it was going to be spent by the daily administration. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of looked at it and said, okay, Mm -hmm. we don't really have much of a choice. The community's got some funding, but it wasn't really inclusive like this program is and this um, with, with the COVID funding here. So I've been really happy to see, you know, the mayor's team reaching out. Not every organization I think has been at the table, but there's still opportunity for that to happen. And um, I think the aldermen have been a good connector in trying to get those community organizations there at the table so that there's sustainable use of these funds. And, you know, we can look back 10 years from now and say, oh, we did a much better job than what we did with it back in 2008 with the, after the housing market crash. Um, uh, The city is increasing FTEs by about 600, even though there are about 4,000 vacancies. What's that about? Um, I think there's a handful across each one of the departments. There's uh, some new police. There's uh, people going into fellowships. Um, There are... Uh, actually, I don't know the full set of details. I haven't added all those up yet, but I know they're kind of spread out through each one of the different departments. And, um, you know, one of the big ones that was brought up was why aren't we hiring more police officers? You know, that number should be be pretty huge, but, uh, in reality, um, no one's really jumping in to be a police officer. Yeah, The police numbers don't go up in the budget very much. And I know you had 700 or so retirements, so there are a lot of vacancies you have to fill. Right, and I I just don't think uh, with as much testing as they're doing or trying to get people to the table, we're just not seeing um, the same amount of people coming in that I think they did in the past. So that's going to be very difficult to fill. And, you know, in a way, that's it's in a way it's kind of good because that means they're not saying we're going to put 500 in even though we can't hire them and, and kind of have that space saved for the police department, which would be, oh gosh, tens of millions, I think. Yes. And that way the funding can be spent on other things that you were talking about. Yeah. Like the, a co-respond model. Yeah. I mean, the increases are in interesting places, you know. Um, uh, like the water department, big increases um, there. Aviation even though air traffic's down, um, big increases there. It's just hard to know. I mean, you have a big job to sort of really nail down where, you know, what all of the, um, what each department is going to want to do, what they're going to do with everybody they've hired, and how they're going to carefully plan on the new spending. Because it's not like this is recurring. So it's not like you're giving the money to do what they always do. You're giving people now a a lot of money to do some new things and that that's very hard to do well. It's going to take sort of, you know, uh, a level management to get that done and to do the careful planning um, so that the money. Absolutely. Right. Um, So I hope as you go department to department, you build in, look, how, you know, what's who's who's responsible for doing the planning for this? So you can bring them back before the council, before you open the spigots and say, okay, well, lay it out for us. How's it going to work? Yeah, and typically that's, you know, one commissioner sitting up there with maybe, you know, two to ten other deputies um, with their finance people from each department. And as a lot of your listeners know, you know, over the next two weeks, every department will come forward. Although, I, you know, it's interesting because um, I think if you're maybe newer to the city, you don't realize that the CTA – the CHA, the Chicago Parks, um, those are sister agencies. So we don't really, we don't get to call them up. Um, right. They might come to us for funding, you know, like tip funding throughout the year and things like that. Right. And, and big ask, um, oh, CPS too. But they work separately from the aldermen, separately from the city council. We don't get to uh, call them in and really question their budgets during the budget hearings. That's correct. And then you have... Yeah, water and aviation, as you mentioned, those are enterprise funds, so um, they can't sort of commingle their budgets with other parts of the city budget. So they they have um, passenger fees that fund that, and they have water rates and or water and sewer fees that uh, fund the water department for the most part. So that um, 
But those two agencies would come forward with their commissioners, and that's where we really try to grill them and figure out, okay, you were given, um, you know, $60 million to do small business support and investments. What have you done with that money so far, or what are you going to be doing with it? And, and really force them to, to drill down. Cause that's, I think you were probably looking at the mayor's speech and every speech, no matter what, you know, it has those, those sort of flowery objectives in it, but then it's up to us to really. Yeah. You got to dig. I mean, I, I, I opened, I read all the, uh, the, I looked through all the budget documents that are public. Um, cause I do, cause of the, you know, once an alderman, you just can't help it. Um, <laughs> I, so I thought it was interesting. Now talk a little bit about, um, what the, what the plans are with, uh, retiring debt. Um, last year, oh. you know, we sort of put it on hold. Are we going to, oh, and I know this is somewhat controversial. The mayor would like to retire a little bit more debt. Some of the aldermen are saying like, forget it, spend the money on, on right direct services. Where, how's that going? Well, I think, um, first of all, you know, we what we might be seeing is a, a good change, um, with, Congress making a few changes. So um, they would reinstate the tax exempt uh, refundings, the advanced refundings, which I think five, four or five years ago was changed by Congress, you know, during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And when they, when they changed that a few years ago, it really drove up the cost of um, refunds. And um, I think we're going to get a change on that in the next couple of months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so essentially, uh, about 460 or 65 million of the 1.2 that we're going to be refinancing would be refunded on a tax exempt rather than taxable. So that would generate us, um, I think 20 or 30 million, um, which would go right back into our budget. So what they're trying, and then that would also lower our interest rate. So a lot of these big ticket items like the, um, the refunds, those will make your head spin, but they also are, you know, done by people. I think, um, the CFO, you know, has been doing a great job, um, watching the market, working with the rating agencies and really trying to, um, change the way that we're, we're doing these. So, you know, there's, um, a lot of inefficient refinancing across the city's interest rate, um, across what we've been doing, but, doing this advanced refunding will allow us to really lock in lower interest rates and we get those upfront savings, um, without causing any long-term, um, headaches, you know, or, or, um, spending 10 years out, 20 years out. So I think, um, they're doing a really good job of just trying to, uh, pull that in. And then part of the refinancing, you know, we're looking at projects like the Michael Reese refinancing Yep, that that's been a thorn in the side for, of the city for many years. And, um, I think we paid something like 30 million, um, over the last five years, just on into of equity into that. And, you know, we're not going to, we've been sitting on that thing, I think for 14 or 15 years. Yeah, just so everybody knows. Um, so this is, this was land hospital. I was born in that hospital in the near South side. Um, uh, the city went into the market, got the money, bought all the land in anticipation of hosting the Olympics, right? Pie in the sky. We didn't host the Olympics. I think better. We'd have been even worse shape had we won that bid, but we ended up with this albatross of a property that we've been paying on nonstop for, as you say, 14 or some years. And um, maybe we, the, the light is at the end of the tunnel. Oh, I think, yeah, and I think it is, uh, we are seeing some light there. So we have about, um, I think when they originally got it, they had like 73 million um, on the original loan. Whatever we paid off over the last several years, mm -hmm. um, we still have like 40 million left. So I think with the sale of the property, <clears throat> finally getting that whole project going, you know, we're going to see revenue coming in from it, um, from the sale of the property and restructuring the debt, which will put us actually put us out uh, a little bit ahead in the long run. So you can take those funds and, you know, work them back into, into the budget. See, that's fabulous. Fabulous. Well, that, Scott, that, the, take, that took a lot of work and, you know, you had, uh, the alderman down there really trying to work to get it, get that project going in the right direction. And, um, mm -hmm. I guess some of these deals take a while, but, 
uh, I feel pretty confident that they're going to have a confident that they're going to have a good um, return on that whole project. But it could have it could have kept going in the wrong direction, and that would have cost us even more. Um, one other area: a year ago, the council and the mayor agreed to put a cost of living increase into the levy. Um, are there are a couple aldermen who've said, look, for all kinds of reasons, people are recovering after COVID, uh, uh, ha- having property tax go up makes more stress on housing everywhere, um, and that some might say, look, let's forgo it. Let's just not add this also to the burden when we have so much external money coming in. Uh, are those conversations real? Um, and is this an issue for m- many members of the council? And how will the mayor um, take those concerns? Well, I think they're listening to everything that the aldermen are, are asking about. Um, you know, we voted on the CPI last year, which I, I actually agreed with because I felt that if we were going to um, essentially say, look, um, we do a CPI increase every year. It might be, you know, 15 to $25 million uh, per year that goes back. That is basically absorbed by the entire uh, levy. Yes. Um, so this year it is $23 million. Yep. Um, I think it creates more predictability and stability. And, um, you know, when, when we look at the number in the newspaper, it says, Oh, it's something like 67 million or, actually maybe 76, but, um, that is also an increase in new property taxes coming on line as well. So you might have 20 new buildings that go up and, you know, 500 new apartment build or, um, say single family homes. And that generates 28 million a year, 30 million a year. So some of that number that's out there is, um, new properties that I see they're putting the two together. They're putting the two together. Yeah. Yeah. And, so the CPI, I mean, here's the way, I mean, I don't know if this happened when you were an alderman, but every three to five years, Rom or Daly would come back and say, Hey, you guys are going to have to bite the big one. We do, we need to do a, you know, say 300, $500 million property tax increase. And everybody would just sigh and kind of go, Oh, this is ridiculous. You know, how come we're doing such a big increase? And the, and the backroom talk was essentially, well guys, because we didn't, we do get into an incremental increase at all. And everything costs go up for government, just like they do for the private industry, no matter where you are, the costs go up. We've had some inflate, you know, if you have inflation, whatever it is. And so essentially we just said, well, why don't we do a predictable, uh, stable increase each year instead of coming back to taxpayers and saying, we're going to slam you with a $500 million increase. Um, let's, you know, let's do this appropriately. And mo- uh, the other cities that I looked at, other places, if they if they're tagged to a property tax increase each year, you know, they try to level it out and make it more predictable. Yeah, for, since and the I, dawn I of time, the since the since we were founded, property taxes were raised in the year after an election, and the theory that yeah. people will forget by the time the election rolls around, and then the next year we'll get a huge property tax increase again. So the logic that you're laying out for a more predictable uh, path makes complete sense. Um, But the oddness of this year is people are recovering from a horrible uh, uh, hit because of COVID, and there's an enormous influx of federal money. So I know it's an issue that's that's not normal this year. And I, I mean, funny, the, you were trying to normalize it when you passed the CPI rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, but talking to Fritz Kagi, he has adjusted for mm-hmm. uh, about 10% for COVID, you know, for property taxes. I think that kind of gets unfortunately eaten up um, a little bit by this, but also, um, you know, on a completely separate issue, if we actually had a board of review and, an, and you know, now we've got an assessor that wasn't playing the games that Barrios used to play. But, um, you know, the board of review is essentially overturning a lot of what uh, Fritz KG is doing. So, you know, we can sit here and look at a, a $23 uh, million increase, but those guys regularly 
you know, uh, reduce a property tax on one building that eats that number up on a, on a monthly basis. Yeah, I, you know, it, So I, they could take a $90 million building and reduce it down to 40 or 45. And that, that eats that up yeah, overnight. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a separate conversation, but a completely legitimate yeah, one to. about the madness in our property tax. No, not the madness. You know, it's, it's never in Cook County all my life. It's been what's legal that's corrupt, not just what's illegal. And what's legal that's gone on in property tax uh, uh, shifting um, and the lawyers who do it and the government people who participate in it is appalling. And uh, like you, I firmly hope that Fritz Kage is able to uh, uh, make the system transparent and drive it through. But, you know, the backlash is as he never got through the Board of Appeals and the electoral backlash is coming. They're funding an opponent, and it's going to be tough, very tough. Yeah, and I, uh, that's a that is a whole another issue. But yeah. the way you know, I've had meetings with him, and he's and we've tried to figure out what the amount is that the city gets hit on because of these this gamesmanship going on at the board of review. Yep, and it's in the it's definitely in the tens of millions. So yeah. I look at it and say. You know that that affects our annual budget. If these guys are playing these games, um, you know, and it's it's sort of this entity that sits off to the side. Nobody really knows about it. Yeah. But they're gaming the system um, in a way that uh, most people don't understand. Well, it it doesn't. But you, the city has a levy, and the levy is whatever it is. It is if it's a billion dollars, if it's five hundred million, if it's ten dollars, that's the levy. That the the system yeah. that's being gamed is who pays it. That's true. Right. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, you still have to figure out what what size levy you want and how much, you know. And so so that anyway, it's going to be an interesting year that way. Well, I, so you've had only what one just one budget hearing so far, right? Yeah, we've started earlier than usual. Uh, so Friday we had the the CFO, the budget director, and the comptroller up. They gave us sort of a um, overview for a few hours of. You know, plus Q and A. Yep. And then as we move into the week, we will have each of the departments coming in, and that's that's where really really get to the meat and potatoes of each one of those yep. uh, those budgets that they have. Um, uh, I promised somebody I would ask this question, so I'm going to ask you: with a budget like this, you know, the the mayor listened to all the aldermen and listened to lots of community groups. Uh, is there anything that that you know, that anybody really wanted to get done that isn't in here? Um, that's a really good question. Because, I mean, you know, normally uh, you have to make tough, you don't just don't have the resources to do everything. You make tough decisions and some things you get done and some things don't get done this year, this year. Or somebody, you know, this looks like everybody got everything. Yeah, it, actually, uh, I think some of the people who are expecting something different said they were pleasantly surprised. Um, I think the people that I've spoken to so far were kind of looking at the, you know, like the micro, uh, micro loans and saying, what's the parameter right. around that project? Yeah. I really like it. Um, that's sort of small potatoes in the whole budget, but it still matters. Um, some were concerned about getting more police in there. And I think, um, you know, maybe just wondering, um, what more we could do on uh, lead pipes. I think somebody brought that up and I can't recall exactly what the amount was going into that, but that was something that I think some people wanted to see a, a much higher amount going toward. But really, you know, when you look at the affordable housing, when you look at the support directly to families, small businesses, I think wanted a little bit more, but we can do more there with TIF funding um, and SPIF, which is small business improvement fund within a TIF. So I think, I think we'll also see support um, going into those other areas from the, the general budget and infrastructure. So um, we even have an artist in I artist saw that. relief fund, which I saw it. it you know, the, and the arts are the one that always get cut. Yep. In every budget, when yep. you have a bad budget, yep. they're the first to go. And the first that left the, the schools. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so, ev so this is this that. is the kitchen sink budget. This is the dream budget that no yeah. politician has ever gotten. Um, but again, we're awash in cash for a change. Um, it, uh, 
what are the how are we going to know that this was a success? What are the in what a year from now we're going to see fewer homeless, um, m- more people uh, able to be stay in the homes that they've got, um, uh, rapid and and meaningful investment in areas of Chicago where we haven't seen it. I mean, I'm making this up. What's the list of, here are the things, here's how Chicago is going to look different because of this budget. Well, and I would, I would almost say, you know, you have to look back next year and see how sustainable it was for next year's budget, but also about five years out and 10 years out, because that'll be really telling. Yeah, that's right. Back at the, so what do you think five yeah, years it, from this budget? What'll be the legacy of this budget? Um, I think, uh, giving a really good underpinning to uh, a lot of the social impacts that we haven't put the funding in over the years that I think we wanted to see. So um, building more affordable housing, um, making sure that the small businesses in the city who are really the backbone of the city get the support that they need. And we don't always talk about the big corporations. Um, I think the uh, health care system, making sure that mental health is, and um, the co-responder model are, are really getting people into the, into the crisis intervention. I think if those types of programs, and that's, that's about three or, you know, maybe three or four like that, because those are really the underpinning of, of society and our communities, um, you know, where that if that's taken care of and we address a lot of these issues of um, racism and um, investment in communities that's, that have been neglected, and if, and if the mayor's Southwest program is successful, I really think, you know, invest Southwest, I think, um, you know, we'll see some, some long-term benefits there. So it's really the investments in areas that we haven't done before that we really have to focus in on. Um, that'll be, pretty telling a year from now and maybe three out. Yep. Well, I know it's an enormous amount of work and it's detailed work and it requires, um, uh, you know, stuff they don't teach you in college. Uh, but to really nope. learn how municipal government works, w- what it's good at, what it has to partner with community groups for, how to have conversations and, and um, partnerships with people in the community that are meaningful and give community folks a meaningful role, not just a mental health role. I mean, a, a, like it makes them feel better role, but a, a real meaningful role. It's ha- very hard to do, and I really appreciate your uh, leadership in the city, the time you're spending to get in the weeds and to work with your colleagues. I just don't, you know, people love to hear how aldermen yell at each other. I don't think they understand how much work you guys do together. Yeah, that's definitely true. And, you know, I, I try to learn from a lot of aldermen in the other areas of the city. I've always tried to do that. I think you, you did too, you know, where you, you tried to communicate with them to find out what the issues were, what, what were the, um, interdependent things that we could do. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just, I was actually just coming back from an event down at all gardens this morning. Well, that is a yeah. long haul from where you are. Yeah, but it was great. We, um, we actually did the, um, open lands event, um, with Erica Nanton and Cheryl Johnson, um, Hazel Johnson's daughter. Um, we are working with open lands and neighbor space to rebuild, uh, access to the river down there. Yep. And we did an African American, um, trail tour down there that they had just set up. And to listen to what they were talking about in terms of um, environmental racism and what had happened down there over a hundred years and how we're trying to change it. And they just basically said, um, we needed you here today. We needed to have you listen to us and hear what changes we need and what the people here um, want to do. And, and to get that done, you know, I had to be there. I couldn't just look at it on paper. So it was, just a great moment today to, to work with them and understand, wow. And what can we do? You know, do we need hundreds of millions of dollars? Yes, probably. But there's things that we can do starting today that, that start the serious change. Yeah. And the open lands work down there. See that change for the first time in decades. Yep. All right, Scott. Well, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, 
I, you're welcome. I, you know, I, I think you're, I, I, you have a dubious distinction here. You're going to be a regular on this show uh, because you no, know, people okay. need to know that just they need to know what how the city works at that level. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of your time. Yeah, and if you want in the future, I can, um, when we get the audit done for the whole city with, uh, you know, that change, the municipal lending, um, which we just changed, then also maybe the workers' comp program, I can pop back on and give you guys a, I would love that. of what love we worked on. I know yeah. it's, a, it's a ton of work, but it's stuff I think you focus in on every day, so I appreciate it. Yep. All right, Scott, take care. Okay, have a great afternoon. Thank bye, you. Bye. We're going to take a, a very short break, and we'll be right back. This is the Consumer Attention Lifeline with an urgent message. A federal jury unanimously ruled that Roundup, a popular weed killer, was a substantial factor in potentially developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Victims who used Roundup and were later diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma have been awarded millions of dollars. One simple phone call is all it takes to find out if you qualify for a cash settlement. Call now for a free confidential case review. It only takes a few minutes, and there are no fees for our service. Thousands of people may have been exposed to this dangerous weed killer over the course of decades. This is a time-sensitive matter, so you must call now. If you or someone you know used Roundup Weed Killer and were later diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, this could be your lifeline to substantial financial compensation. Just call 1-800-737-5088. Call 1-800-737-5088 now. For terms and conditions, visit yourrights.legal. Call 1-800-737-5088 This is WCPT 820, where facts matter. You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisendrath on WCPT 820. Well, I, I can't believe we're nearing 4 o'clock and time has flown by as fast as it has. I wanted to talk to you about a lot of other things uh, at 773-763-9278. You you heard from some aldermen about how the city works, how the budget process works. Um, But I want to talk about one other thing, and it relates to our national politics before we go. And it begins with, you know those those stories where the villain has some mind control technology where somehow they take away the free will of their victims. It's the trope that was the center of um, Marvel's Black Widow uh, movie this year. You know, at some point a young woman cries that she doesn't want to kill herself, but she really doesn't have a choice. The idea of somehow losing your freedom this way, it's a... you know, it's a perennial go-to for stories when they need to have a clear uh, 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 way to show the audience who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. So it's just absolutely clear. But it really isn't just fiction anymore. What freedom, really, we have lots of them in America, what freedom is more important than freedom of thought? Uh, and, and you think, I think, at least with some horror about the forced re-education campaigns that went on during uh, Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution in China, and they were all aimed at correcting the you know erroneous thoughts of educated Chinese. And they didn't. The Maoists didn't force people to kill themselves, but they sure did get a lot of public recantations of of thought by chastened scholars who now were wearing the Communist Party glasses. So we, you know, we think we're above that here in America. We, we have, you know, protections written into our Constitution that keep anything from that kind of control out of government. It couldn't happen, right? We say that. And yet, in parts of our country, in the parts where people are, are standing up and shouting about freedom the loudest, we've seen that uh, at the call of party leaders, ordinary Americans actually do drink poison. They drink hydroxychloroquine. Some drink bleach. They take horse medicine. Um, In Arizona, the cyber ninjas finished their fake audit yesterday in Maricopa County. It was an audit ordered by Karen Fan, the president of the Arizona uh, Senate, Republican president of their Senate. And, you know, yesterday they had to report there was no fraudulent vote count. In fact, they did find a few votes were mistallied, but they all were in favor of Joe Biden. He actually had more votes than they thought. And um, uh, 
the Senate president was quoted yesterday as saying, you know, people thought this was a sham, but we're telling the truth. The truth is the truth, her quote says. Numbers are numbers, she says. Um, but just as quickly, she, she then said, but I'm forwarding all this to the state's attorney general, who happens also to be another Republican, to investigate the serious uh, claims of voter irregularities. Okay, seriously? She just had this crazy group, the Cyber Ninjas, spend a whole lot of state money and a whole lot of time doing an audit. And the, and the end of the audit is, and we have to, and the end of the audit is there's no fraud, but she's going to try and keep this going. She's going to send it on for more. These people have no free will. They've given it up. The evidence before their own eyes no longer matters. The only thing that matters is the lie. <sighs> And, um, you know, I've had on today really interesting people, people who are doing, well, I don't agree with everything they said. They don't agree with each other, uh, but they're doing the hard work of, of governing. And, and, and instead, you have apparatchiks like Karen Finn in Arizona who no longer can make choices. They can't look at the evidence, even evidence that they brought to the table. They can't look at it. They can't see it. They can't do anything other than parrot the lie they're told to, to say. I, we live in this crazy duality where most of us are working in the real world, and yet there's a sizable group of our fellow citizens who live in some dystopian fantasy island, and it plays itself out in such important ways. And, you know, I hope in the coming weeks you guys will call and we can talk about this because, um, look, just this week, just this week, the House, and, and again, it's Democrats, it's led by Nancy Pelosi, but they passed the Women's Health Protection Act. That law finally takes the entire issue of abortion away from the courts by protecting choice in law. They passed an increase to the debt ceiling and a continuing resolution so that government can stay open and uh, the full faith of, and credit uh, of the United States is preserved. They passed National Defense Reauthorization Act to fund our armed services. They've started now to mark up the Build Back Better agenda. They start tomorrow, to Monday, to do that, and we'll bring it to the floor along with a bipartisan infrastructure bill. The Senate you know, hasn't hasn't gotten these yet, but this is serious work. It's serious, hard work. And House Democrats, look, they don't agree with each other on lots of things, right? And they don't agree, and lots of us don't agree with all of them on lots of things, but they're doing the hard work. What are the Republicans doing? They're doubling down on their frauds and their lies. They're pushing vaccine fears. If you look at Fox, they're inciting racial anger with um, so-called replacement theory stories. They're harassing people at restaurants for wearing masks. They're telling uh, people that Democrats are sneaking vaccine into salad dressing. Crazy stuff. They're threatening school board members for teaching about civil rights. I mean, God, there's a lot going on right now. And uh, people who do have the freedom, the freedom of thought to look at the world, to look at what's going on, they make informed decision. Prisoners do what they're told. So if the right wants freedom, they're going to have to open their eyes a little bit. I mean, we Democrats may argue with each other, but um, we're doing the work. And all the lies, and we talked about this last week, all the lies that are being told on the right are really there in order to create confusion, create anger, sow uncertainty, and sow doubt to create conditions, in short, um, so that they can finally succeed in their quest to... Uh, take over to, to form the coup that 2020 was just a dress rehearsal. And if you don't believe me, we are going to spend more time on the election laws that are being passed in state after state that are meant to give power to actually change the results to a handful of Republican appointed guys in different states. That's actually happening. We need to stay vigilant. We need to preserve, pers I'm sorry, we need to persevere Everybody needs to get involved because you make a difference. And later on, we can talk about what a difference that makes. Because I don't think, look, I think we're going to win, and I don't think the next century is going to be the American century. I think it's going to be humanity's century. We don't live in countries the same way anymore. But what that means is going to depend a great deal on what you do 
to make sure our democracy is protected. And with that, I have to go. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you being, for being with me on this first show. Take care. This is John Daniel, President and Business Manager of the Sheet Metal Workers of Smart Local 265. The principles that guide me are rooted in the simple belief that united we stand and divided we fall.